Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. Uh, viewer and listener discretion on this one. We're interviewing an amazing individual named Clark Fredericks. Clark tells his story of abuse, of being raped as a young man, and a story that culminates in murder and ultimately redemption and him now living a life helping others uh, dig in it's a three hour long discussion that i know is going to be powerful and impactful here we go hey guys welcome to yet another episode of the higher line podcast guys and girls first of all it's halloween 2022 so if you see the sweet mustache i was just in new orleans with friends and yes, I shaved so I could have a Magnum PI costume, which Clark Friedrichs doesn't know yet, but I walked around the streets of New Orleans for three days in the shortest shorts money could buy with this mustache. But that's not what we're here to talk about. I found Clark online. Uh, he was on the uh, YouTube channel, Soft White Underbelly, right, Clark? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And he's got an amazing story. Uh, he's probably sick of people saying it's an amazing story because it's his life and it it uh, is something that he had to uh, spend years working through. But I want him to share the story with us in, in some detail. But I also want to direct you guys throughout this podcast when you're done here to go visit Soft White Underbelly and you can hear uh, several hours of him discussing his life in general uh, and some of the things that happened to him. An amazing tale of uh abuse of prison of even murder and the takeaway why i want to bring him on is talking about redemption and healing and how we can move forward in our own lives uh when really bad shit maybe has happened to us been done to us and 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 uh been inflicted on us especially to the least of us being children so welcome clark uh how many times have you done this now in the last year or two? Uh, well, with, when uh, COVID hit, uh, you know, that was really the only way to uh, keep uh, getting the message out was through uh, podcasts. Um, so I don't know. I, you know, I've done uh, I've done really small ones where, you know, people have a couple thousand followers uh, up to uh, I did like the top rated uh true crime podcast sword and scale and i i did uh soft white underbelly which has about four million subscribers and now you know you have several hundred thousand so uh the, you know the whole range from a few thousand up to a few million so yeah very cool well, i appreciate you taking the time time to do this uh synopsis like uh what's the we'll, we'll dig into a couple parts and like i told you before we began recording um, I don't want to put you through having to go through every sort of detail, but uh, just so the listener viewers here today understand who you are and why you're with us, why don't I'll just shut up and I'll let you let you. Yeah, I'll give you a away. quicker. I'll give you a quick synopsis, you know, and then we can uh, we can go into bullet points. Um, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey called Stillwater, and uh, it's just like it sounds. And the Paul and Skill River cuts right through the town. And it's just like it sounds. You know, there's hunting, fishing, hiking. We have a ski resort in our county. Everything's based outdoors. Um, very rural, very picturesque. And it would seem like a very safe place to raise children. But sometimes those are the most riskiest places because people fall into a a false sense of security in uh, places like that. And that's what happened. Uh, that's what happened with me. And also what contributed to my abuse was I grew up in the seventies um, and things were very different back then. There was no such thing as a helicopter mom. Uh, there was no internet, no computer, no, no uh, cell phones. Um, so to get any information on abuse, to get information on predators and pedophiles, uh, it just wasn't known back then and it wasn't talked about. You know, children, the saying back then was 
children were meant to be seen, not heard. And the priests, especially the Catholic priests, were still exalted. Uh, people like Boy Scout leaders were looked up to. And I joined the uh, Scouts. I had a uh, older brother who was in the Scouts, and his Scoutmaster befriended our family. Mm. And I, from my earliest recollection, five years old, I remember this guy, Dennis Pegg, being over at our house. And I had, I was born with a hole in my heart. And at, at uh, six, seven years old, I had open heart surgery. And the scar I was left with would be Dennis's avenue to begin his physical grooming of me. My parents were so proud that I survived this operation. They used to have me lift my shirt to show my scar to all their friends and collect a quarter from everybody. One of their friends was Dennis Pegg, my brother's scoutmaster. Dennis was also a lieutenant in the local sheriff's department. So he, you know, he had a dual a dual avenue of raising his, his stature in the community. He was the scoutmaster and he was a lieutenant in the sheriff's department. And he was involved in, he put himself in every type of organization you could think of. And, and if you Google his obituary, Dennis Pegg obituary, I think his family thought they were doing him this great service by listing all the things he was involved in. But what the police have said is that all those organizations were his hunting ground for children. Dennis was a professional hunter of children, and I fell victim to his. Um, what what other organizations? Just some of them. So he's part of Boy Scouts. Uh, the Audubon Society. Okay. I'm in the gym one day, and a lady comes up to me and says, "Are you Clark Fredericks?" I'm like, "Yes," and she goes, "Um." Uh, I have a girlfriend whose son was in the Autobahn Society with Dennis Pegg, and Dennis destroyed his life by abusing so him. So, young man trying to learn about flowers or birds, and yeah, and oh, good. Grief. And this guy, uh, this guy destroyed him. Uh, I had a I had a guy reach out to me on Facebook. Uh, he didn't want to become Facebook friends, but he sent me a private message saying. In like 1970 or 71, there's a state park in our county. And he said Dennis Pegg was, they had, they used to have summer camps there. I never, I never knew they had summer camps at this place. But he said back in the beginning of the 70s, there were summer camps and his camp counselor was Dennis Pegg. And Dennis Pegg abused him at the, at the camp. He was in Boys Town. An honorary First member of in, Boys in, Town. In Omaha? Yeah. <laughs> and if you Google, if there's ever been abuse in Boys Town, a couple names come up. His name hasn't popped up, but that doesn't mean he wasn't involved. I've actually visited that place once as a, not as a resident, but just to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Famous. yeah. Um, Kiwanis. He was a member of the Kiwanis Club, which is for improving the lives of children in your community. So it's just on and on and on there's a whole list of, of, of stuff like that did he have children of his own or a family no, of his own he was never married okay nope so uh he started his physical abusing right a few months after my open heart surgery by by wanting to touch my open heart surgery scar so you and were you were five at the time i was uh six or seven um you know he he came to the house i we had a, a big backyard everybody was in the backyard i came in to get a, a drink and to watch tv for a minute it was a hot summer day i was still weak from the surgery it was just a few months after the surgery so i came in to rest and there's a knock at the front door which was right next to the tv room and it's dennis and he comes in and tussles my hair. You know, be wary of be wary of hair tusslers. You know, they're they're you gotta watch, you gotta watch, you know, hair tussling may seem innocent, but that's the, the, the groomers want to start grooming you and, and they need to touch you to groom you. And hair tussling 
is an innocent way to start their grooming process. Just to um, jump in a little bit yeah. as an uncle of, I don't know, I got like eight little nephews and I've got uncles and stuff. I had plenty of guys as a kid, like uncles of mine going to grab you and mess yeah, with I'm your not, hair. I, I'm not saying that you're saying that, but, and I, you're going to paint a whole picture here, but I, I think what you're saying is something that might look innocuous and just meaningless right. could have very deep meaning. They take something innocent and twist it and start using it for their evil. And, and you know, you know, I, I had someone else reach out to me who wasn't sexually abused by Dennis, but it was leading up to that. And he would be in Dennis's truck. Dennis would be driving this young boy to places. And Dennis would start telling jokes and laughing with this boy in the truck. And he would like start slapping his his leg, you know, laughing and slapping his leg. Isn't that funny? And then he would like rest his hand on the leg and just leave it there. You know, so they need they need avenues which seem innocent of touch just to get you used to that. And that's, that's how predators work. Um, so you guys are in your living room. You're watching a little. Yeah, he says, hey, I got a quarter to see your scar like my parents have done many times. So I'm like, sure. And I lift my shirt up. And this time he says, I've never seen a scar. I have a keloid condition where my scars are raised up. Scar tissue builds up. So he goes, I've never seen a scar so raised as yours. How about a dollar if you let me touch it? I idolized Dennis. He always had his badge. He always had a gun. He was the big man around town. Next to my father, I trusted him the most. And I looked up to him the most next to my father. So I'm like, sure, Den. So he takes his fingers and starts going up and down my open heart surgery scar. And then he starts probing beneath my scar right around my belt line, asking me if my stomach is sore from the surgery. And I'm like, no, Den. So he does that for a minute or so and then says, here's your dollar. Go put it in your piggy bank. And this has to be our little secret that I touched your scar. We can't be army buddies if you can't keep a secret. Dennis mm -hmm. was special ops in Vietnam and he has a sealed record. Whatever happened in Vietnam, I don't know if we'll ever know. Um, but they sealed his record for some reason. Was something done to him or did he do things over there? Who knows? Um, but he called me his army buddy, you know, and uh, and I told him, of course I can keep a secret then. And being a secret keeper is what did me in, you know. Every, I grew up in a lake com community, Ponskill Lake, is a lake community and back then as soon as you could learn to ride a bike you were told to be gone and there was a dam area down at the lake we were fishing and basketball courts and jungle gyms and tennis courts and that's where all the kids hung out and that became dennis's trolling ground so he did most of his activity out of the watchful eye of my parents he would come by our house all the time and just be a gregarious guy, but he wasn't like spending any special time with me. That was all down at the lake. And it just became one thing after another, after another, after another. Alcohol got involved, got introduced at a really young age. Pornography got induced in introduced at a really young age. And everything was a secret. Everything he told me, various things, and they were secrets I had to keep. Alcohol was a secret I had to keep. Pornography was a secret I had to keep. How, how old was he, were you the first time that he offered you alcohol? You're nine years, digits. nine years old. And did you want to drink or was it just like he? Oh, I thought it was he's, fantastic. Like you he's know, cool. Like, yeah, I'm getting to, I'm getting to have a beer. You know, he, he said, you know, people, a couple people on the Soft White Underbelly podcast, you know, called me out in their comments you know, saying, I said, Dennis said the term, let's hop in my pickup truck and split a six pack. 
A and this was at what time? Nine years uh, old. And and so that was 70s still? Yeah, I was born in 65. So this is, you know, 74. Okay. When I say split a six pack, I don't mean he took three beers out and gave me it. It means yeah. I had a beer. He's sitting around bullshitting yeah, with it's, a dude it's a in term, his truck. Like split a six yeah. pack. And people, you know, soft on the belly. So you're telling me at nine, he gave you three beers and he had three. And they're, they're a little like, too no, literal. That's not necessarily what it means. It's it was a term he used. Let's split a six pack. Doesn't mean I had he gave me three beers. But I had beer with him at nine years, starting at nine years old. And when he said this has to be our secret, I could get in a lot of trouble for giving you beer. I thought to myself, why would I want to ruin this? I'm nine years old getting to have a beer with a lieutenant from the sheriff's department. I'm not going to ruin this. Yeah, you were in like Flynn, man. You were, yeah, He's yeah. got me, dude. He's got me. Did your parents ever smell beer on you? Or No, Dennis was very careful to always have gum and candy available. Always make sure here, don't. Don't let anybody smell your breath. Take some candy. Take some gum. You know, he's very, very careful about that. Very calculated. Yeah. I mean, this, look, he he might have had a dozen boys at various stages of the grooming process. So he he knew what he had to do, you know, from trial and error to protect himself, you know? So if... If having candy and gum on hand at all times is one of the things, you know, he was sure to have it. And I wasn't the only one down at the lake community that he would invite into his truck to have beer. There was there was various other boys that would get into the truck and have beer with him. I would see I would see somebody down at the lake a week or two later and they'd be like, oh, I got to have beer with Dennis the other day. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, cool. Me too. So. You know, he's testing the waters and he's he's putting out bait, you know, to trap us. And, uh, you know, just just to skim along. I don't want to go into detail. I can hear more detail on the other podcast. Like you feel, said. feel free if something comes to mind that you feel is valuable talking about the I not I don't want to limit you or limit your uh, sharing. So whatever. No, well, you want to share if, if you if you if your listeners take heed to what I just said, um, you know, they have to introduce predators have to introduce physical touch at some point. So what you know, the tussling of the hair, the other story with the padding of the thigh and the truck and then resting the hand there after telling a joke. Um, you know, secrets, 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 secrets. Never, ever, ever should an adult ask a child to keep a secret. There's mm -hmm. no reason where that should ever be the norm. A, a, a father, a mother shouldn't be telling a young six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old, keep this a secret from your father. Keep this a secret from your mother. There's no reason right. for it. Right. Children do not need to keep secrets. So that's that's another important thing. You know, Teach your children that nobody should ever ask you to keep a secret. Um, and then and then there's like a playbook for, for pedophiles, predators, where they have to introduce either drugs or alcohol into the scenario. They have to introduce pornography into the scenario to get you comfortable because they're building up to something that's horrific and they got to get you into their comfort zone desensitized a little bit yeah maybe. desensitizing all the way bro yep so it led up to wrestling matches where at the time i didn't realize it or didn't want to realize it but looking back where he was erect having wrestling mm. matches mm. that led up to him performing oral sex on me that led up to him raping me at age 12. and my life was altered at at those moments you know uh i grew up as an altar boy in the episcopal church and back then in, in the 70s you know i had this old priest and he made it sound that god was a sovereign god in charge of every aspect of your life. If you do good, good things will happen. If you step out of line, you could incur God's wrath. So here I am at 12 getting raped 
and screaming out, crying out, and looking for my God to strike this piece of crap down, and nothing ever happened. No one heard my screams. No one heard my cries. I felt alone in the world. And the only the only being that heard my screams and cries when he was raping me was his coon dog in the other room. And his coon dog started howling and howling and howling. And when Dennis had finished his act with me, he cleaned me up, brought me out to his kitchen table, got me another beer, like, like we were just two lovers, you know, that had a romantic tryst. And uh, he went and got his coon dog and brought the dog in front of me and said, this is what will happen to you, Clark, if you open up your mouth about what just happened. And he beat and he beat and he beat and he beat his dog until it lay into a clump at my feet. And I'm screaming, I'm crying, I'm pleading and begging with him to stop because that to me was worse than the rape I just went through because I felt responsible for that innocent dog because it was only howling because of my cries. And, and, and like he, like after that occurred, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to run home to my parents when this guy just beat his dog and into an unconscious possible dead clump in front of me? Instead, he dropped me back off with my bicycle down at the, the dam area. I went down the river so I would be away from all the kids. I didn't want to see anybody. And I was inconsolable down on the river, just hugging myself and crying and rocking. And I, my mind told me right then, we are not going to talk about this. Talking about it is reliving it. And we definitely don't want to relive what just happened. Mm -hmm. And our minds think they're protecting us by doing that. They're, they're like trying to, to limit the damage. Yes. Yeah, so instead, instead they're they're destroying us because you need if if you don't talk about it immediately and go running to your parents or to someone you trust, you're you're going to be faced with a lifelong road of self destruction. You know, I, I self destructed throughout my whole life, and pretty much every victim I've heard from has done the same thing. So that was twelve yeah i'm assuming this continued for some time no that was a one and only time that was the last time that rape so you'd see him around town yeah what i did is that christmas before um you know this is the summer so the christmas before i had gotten a dirt bike and to avoid playing down at the dam area with the other kids my age I started riding dirt bikes with kids that were older in my lake community to avoid that dam area. I'm like, I'm not hanging out at the dam anymore. I, I don't want to go down there. So I started riding dirt bikes with kids from around the lake who are a couple years older than me. And they all smoked weed. And I needed some sort of coping skill to handle what was going on mentally and emotionally within me. And I start smoking weed a few months after the rape occurred. So you're like in seventh, eighth grade, smoking weed. Yeah. Back then they had just built a new high school. In the high school, they took seventh and eighth grade from the elementary school and put it into the high school. All right. So when I graduated sixth grade at the elementary school, it was that summer before I started seventh grade that the rape occurred. And in sixth grade, at Stillwater Elementary, if you told me I would be smoking weed in three months. I would have I would have been like, no way. I don't even know what weed was. And yet I've got so much pain and trauma swirling inside of me. I need something to to quiet it down. And when these kids offered me a joint or a bowl of weed, I was like, sure. And there I start smoking weed. So another thing, you know, if we're looking for key points out of this story, all right. So you have you have the grooming process which I showed you. Now you have a change in behavior. When you have a young child with a sudden change in behavior, there's almost always a reason behind it. My parents found in my room 
you know, in seventh grade, I had a bowl, I had rolling papers and I had weed and a little safe I had in my room. I come home one day and they're sitting on my bed. I'm like, oh my God. And my father walks in right behind me. And he's like, I am not putting it. And, you know, and this is another thing, you know, like he took the disciplinarian authoritarian approach with me. He's like, I am not putting up with this shit. If you're going to be smoking that shit, I'm sending you to military school. I already researched and there's a school right outside of Philadelphia. He goes, your ass will be down there. So he missed an opportunity to like open up a dialogue with me and be like, son, what the what f going, going on? on? Bro? You know, you yeah. got to he 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 made me clam up. I'm already clammed up because of the abuse. And then now he took, you know, the hard line approach with me and it just made me clam up even more. And you got to open up dialogue with your kids. If there's a sudden change behavior, there's a reason why. I got caught in eighth grade shoplifting cigars from the mall, from a CVS pharmacy in the mall. Uh, I used to light fires all around our property. I, I lit our backyard on fire with all the, all the leaves. I lit the corner of our house on fire. And using fire, doing arson, shoplifting, those are signs of abuse. So again, I, I you know, like, they, they're finding drugs in, in my room. I'm playing with fire. I'm shoplifting. There's signs for you, but they, they all went unnoticed, you know. Um, I you let my guard. You weren't yeah. mature enough at that age to say, hey, I got to talk to you. You're a young boy without the tools and communication skills to chat about this. Yeah, you know, uh, abuse victims have so much shame that they're dealing with and so much pain. It's tough to to want to talk about it. You know, you're you're just filled with shame about what's going on. And let alone, you know, a lot of the people that reach out to me who are victims were abused by a member of their household. So I, you know, if you're going home daily to nightly abuse, you know, how are you supposed to talk then? Um, you know, so the, the, you know, you have self-hatred, you have shame and you have an immense amount of pain and trauma and, you know, you need to open up dialogues with your children in order to get to the root cause of what's changing their behavior. You know, there's How did this affect always... relationships like, uh, with your buddies or with girls as a youngster what was that now how, how did it affect you with relationships at that age like with your buddies uh with girls well you know i tell people I, i've led the most exhausting life because my mother worked in the library of the new high school so here i am having been horribly abused and i gotta go to school every day and keep my smile cranked up you know, mom, mom's in the library. She knows all the teachers. She's friends with everybody. You know, I, I can't, I can't go in there racked with pain. So, you know, we all have two faces, the face we show the world and the face behind closed doors. And if there's a big discrepancy between those two faces, you usually have misery in your life or a lot of pain in your life. I had the mm -hmm. biggest discrepancy discrepancy between my two faces. So to my classmates, to my teachers, to my mother in the library, I, I developed this big outgoing personality, this big ego, just to keep everybody, you know, fooled and at bay. And, uh, you know, it's exhausting living like that. But that's, that's, that's how I had to do it. As I went into high school, um, alcohol became more readily available to get and i became a heavy drinker you know i he, these are two more signs you know to look for in uh, abuse victims is i abandoned sports and i gave up on my studies i was a smart enough kid that i could virtually do zero studying and get c's and an occasional b and that was that was fine by me so if you see your child give up on sports, give up on studies, 
again, change in behavior, there has to be a reason why. Nobody ever questioned me why. The only one who questioned me why was my principal who called me into his office one day. I had, I had got caught on a class trip drinking. I came into school drunk and got suspended. And the principal called me into his office and said, Clark, I, what is going on with you? I, I just don't understand. Like you have unlimited potential and I don't see you using it at all. You squander it. And, uh, you know, I get emotional at that part of the story because I, I felt like this bile coming up from my stomach that wanted out, you know, this, you know, oh, like, like there was an opportunity you could have said, Hey, let me tell you something. Yeah. And, uh, it, it was rising up and, uh, I took a big swallow and I just put my hands out like that. I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, that was it. Why, you know? why do you, I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to sound flippant, but why do you feel that that particular part of this story makes you emotional? I mean, this is all pretty emotional shit. Yeah. Is it because you see an opportunity right there that you could have. Yeah. Cause that was yourself? really like, you know, if, if, if you don't reach, a child before they get out of high school and then they're off to the races you know and that was really like my last ditch uh chance i started to say earlier and then I, I went on to a different topic but in seventh grade in english class we got given uh the task of writing a one-page short story and the teacher gave out letters of the alphabet to every student in the class Okay. And you had to use that letter of the alphabet to start as many words in your short story story as possible. I got the letter S and I wrote about being a slave on a ship where the shipmaster was a gay guy who every night would come into my bunk and put his hands on my shoulder and try to molest me. And I wrote how I had to keep a metal pipe next to me to beat him off with. Wow. To get him off of me. And the teacher gave me an A and said, use more paragraphs next time. And that was like my only time next to the principal calling me into his office. Those two times were the only times I, I, you know, I almost opened up. I did open up in that, in that short story. Like, how do you, how do you think a 12 year old writing about a guy coming in to molest them in their bed is just using my imagination and not right. And not something seriously wrong, but it went unnoticed. Maybe you know, maybe because my mother worked in the high school, they would have thought like, surely, surely Joan would know what's going on with Clark. And they they let it slide. They didn't bring it up. They didn't bring it up to my mother, and it went unnoticed. So so yeah, that that thing with the principal that was you know my senior year. That was like the last thing before I'm I'm, I'm beginning adulthood. You know. Uh, a, f a few weeks after graduating high school, I got a drunk driving. You know, we were uh, we were just a whole bunch of us were going nuts after we graduated partying and uh, I got a drunk driving. I went off to college without a license. And in college, uh, uh, I went to I graduated high school in 84. So I started college in 84 and you know, cocaine was at its heyday in the 80s. And I tried cocaine in college for the first time and just thought it was incredible. I loved it. And, uh, you know, that would stay with me off and on throughout my ad adult life until the end where it really grabbed hold of me and dug its claws into me. Uh, but I would use coke sporadically going through the rest of my life. And one, th one thing, Mickey, that I found very difficult to do from the time I was raped was live within my boundaries. Hmm. We all have boundaries that we, you know, we feel comfortable being within. And I couldn't stay within mine. You know, smoking weed at 12 years old was blowing through a boundary. Drinking heavily in high school was blowing through a boundary. Getting a drunk, my parents were, were like on me constantly about drinking and driving and yet i blow through that boundary and get a drunk driving you know 
doing harder drugs, you know, I did acid, I did mushrooms, I did cocaine in, in college. Th those are all boundaries. So boundaries started to become meaningless. I couldn't, I couldn't live within them. If I, if I wanted to distract myself from the pain and hurt I had inside, and it took me outside of a boundary I set for myself, so be it. I, I was going to go outside those boundaries. So boundaries, like throughout my whole life, became absolutely meaningless. So through those years, your early 20s, you never sat down and just thought, geez, I'm f I got to figure this out. It just was, I don't want to use the word easier. I'm not trying to limit pain or anything of that nature, but it was, it was easier to get f versus sit there and self analyze and, right. and yeah you know this feels better than this so i'm going to do the better than this thing yeah yeah and uh you know i i ended up later on reading a book on mindfulness called the power of now sure i really Tolle. like yeah eckhart tolle, eckhart yeah. tolle. I, I met him in like really? 1990 2000 doing a book signing yeah really yeah. Um, and that book really changed my life. It really opened up a lot of things in my mind. But going back to my 20s, like you just said, was there any time I would sit and be reflective and, and, and contemplate my actions? No. And I didn't, I didn't attribute my actions to the abuse. Like, it's not like I, like, Every like I got a drunk drive and or I tried cocaine or I tried mushrooms and I said that's because of Dennis Pegg. No, I didn't attribute to that. But there was so that something inst that instance back in your past was just a thing that was there. You didn't say I'm doing all this because of that. That right? No, I had I got therapy the first time I got therapy. My therapist asked me, "Did you dwell?" on Dennis Pegg in the abuse in your 20s and 30s. And I had to sit for a minute and think, and I'm like, no, like, it's not like I thought of the abuse or Dennis constantly in my mind, but there was something driving my behavior to self-destruction. And mm -hmm. she said, that's normal. She said, you know, abuse victims, uh, in their 20s and 30s and even into their 40s can distract themselves with life. And it's not till late 40s, 50s that that doesn't work anymore. And everything usually comes to a head at that age. Um, How old were you when you started to seek some therapy? I didn't get therapy until I was in prison. Okay. All right. So this was yeah. nothing that was you're doing on your own, really. I mean, it was choice your choice in prison but yeah yeah i don't want to no. i don't want to jump ahead so yeah. you're in college you're tearing it up doing some coke yep yep I'm, i meet the love of my life uh you know i went to a five-year college northeastern up in boston you know they have a co-op program so it's an extra year because you're working in your major and going to school so it takes an extra year so um you know i dated uh this girl lisa for six years and uh I always explain that I could have sex, but being intimate was a completely different thing. Hmm. And I've heard that over and over and over from abuse victims. Like, talk about that a little bit. I don't mean talk about how you have sex unless yeah. you want to, but like, <laughs> <laughs> like um, what do you mean? You could do the physical act, but you were yeah. not connecting on an intimate level. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and you know, like I, I enjoyed being the wild, crazy boyfriend. You know, I was, I was, you know, a bit of a Looney Tune, you know, party animal. And I, you know, you, you develop this persona about yourself and then like to squash the persona you've built around you. I viewed it as I didn't want to be the broken duck with a broken wing boyfriend. You know, like I didn't want to be the abused boyfriend. I liked being the party, wild, crazy guy boyfriend. But it prevented me, when you're holding in secrets, it prevents you from being intimate. You can't be intimate if your whole life is a secret. 
and I had secrets up to my chin. Mm. And Lisa and I had a very active sex life, but intimacy was a different story. And she would say, you know, like we'd be in bed together and I would just drift off. And she'd be like waving her hand in front of my eyes, like Clark, Clark, Clark. And then she'd push me and I'd be like, what? She's like, where are you disappearing to? And I, I you know, I, I was disappearing into my mind, you know, and I couldn't tell her why um, or if I even knew why. Um, and she eventually wanted to take our relationship to the next level and, you know, wanted to start a life together and a family. And I just told her I couldn't do it after six plus six and a half years. She's like, what do you mean you can't do it? I'm like, I, I can't do it. The thought of the thought of doing that scared me being like, I felt like long-term relationships, long-term careers, I felt trapped in them. Hmm. And trapped is how I felt when I was getting abused. And my mind said, we're never gonna feel trapped again. So throughout my twenties, I graduated with honors from Northeastern. And I went from one job to another, to another, to another, to another. I was, I was unemployed as much as I was employed in my 20s. I, I, I would stick sometimes for six months, move on. Sometimes a year, move on to another job. I worked on Wall Street for a couple of years, moved on. Um, I just, uh, I just, I, I always had to stay in constant motion, Mickey. I, I I was always trying to outrun the pain from my past, and I had to stay in constant motion to do that. Were you Were you aware of it ever? No, I like mean, I aware say, of the pain, but aware of you trying to outrun it. No, that's you know, in hindsight, I'm saying that at the so time you had just I'm built just like, up this process of keep keep running down the road, keep 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 the shit in the keep past. the pedal to the metal, like. There was no quiet time in my life. There was no self-analysis in my life. You know, mm -hmm. it was all just full steam ahead and let the cards fall where they may. So did you have any, you're doing all these drugs and, and party and were you making money, paying your bills? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, as long as I had enough money to go out and party and chase women in my 20s, I was happy. And I always had, I always had that. Um, and in my twenties, I used sex as a coping skill. You know, that was my drug in my twenties. It wasn't cocaine, alcohol. Yes. Went along with the chase of women, but the pursuit of women was first and foremost in my mind. If I can sleep with enough women, I'll feel, I'll feel secure and manly. I won't feel you know, I won't, it'll take rid of that self-loathing and self-hatred and insecurity I have. But when I would chase a woman and sleep with her, then I would just immediately go back to how I felt, you know, empty and lonely and insecure and self-hatred. So the only thing I knew to do was to go con, do another conquest and another conquest and another conquest. And at, when I hit my thirties, I just I, I felt empty inside from living that way for a decade. And uh, I needed it's like any other drug, you know, you need more and more and more to get the same desired results. So that the sex result wasn't working anymore for me. So I started gambling in my 30s hmm. and. Uh, you know, at, at this point, I started uh, working with my uh, brother. He had a tire automotive center and he, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years old and I wasn't working at the time. And he said, why don't you come on with me? I want to open up a second store and you can run the other store. I was like, all right, I got nothing else going on. What the hell? I would be in business with him for the next 16 years. Um but I started gambling right around that same time that I joined on with him. And when you walked, when a, for me as an abuse victim, when I walked in through those casino doors and the sounds and the lights and the cocktail waitresses and the action, it took, I, I checked all my pain at the front door. 
Interesting. I went in there. It was like a protective bubble for me. And it was just, it was so much, so much stimulus. You couldn't yeah. go inside. Exactly. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I became addicted to gambling. And I had, a, I had an incredible five-year run in the casinos. I won, I'm making $700 a week in the tire business. And um, I'm gambling tens of thousands of dollars. And I'm winning huge amounts of money. I'm losing large amounts of money. You know, uh, I had a briefcase at home with like $250,000 in chips and cash in it. For a long, long time, I had that, you know, and it would go up or down a little. And it never made me any, there was no happiness to it. It actually, it was actually momentum to lead a more self-destructive life by having mm. that money around. I didn't respect money. It was just a tool for me to, you know, use to live a harder, faster life. And let's uh, go, let's, let's go back for a second. So now you're in your thirties, you're, yep. you're doing this crazy shit. I was looking up pictures of the town that you grew up in. And I've drove all over New Jersey. Most people think of New Jersey as like Jersey Shore or like Trenton or, or you know, like those. Kind of not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just shitty, yeah. you know, kind of city areas or industrial areas. But so much of it is gorgeous. Right. Your family still live there, I'm assuming. Yeah. Mom and dad and friends and stuff. So you go home and visit. Yeah, well, after college, uh, my father put up money for me to get involved in a business uh just over the pennsylvania border in east stroudsburg okay um so i was living back in my area and traveling a half hour to east stroudsburg okay so i after college i came back to the to the area right where the abuse happened so do you see this monster around town and yeah you know a couple times he lived on the other side of stillwater and i avoided without even realizing why I avoided it, but I avoided that side of Stillwater like the plague. Hmm. So there was a few times, I, I, you know, I remember in my 20s going into a bar and he was in the bar. I remember a, a girl I dated, and I don't remember this though, we, we were headed to a, a friend's house for a party and at a stop sign, we were at a stop sign and coming, you know, making a turn coming up alongside of us was Dennis Pegg in his pickup truck. And she said, I just went ballistic and started punching the steering wheel and yelling, yelling what a piece of shit this guy is. You don't remember that now. And then she said, and she said that night you got completely bombed at Joe's house that night. She's like, I had to drive home. I'm like, ah, you know, this is, this is a decade, you know, later she's telling me this i'm like mm. yeah i don't recall that at all she goes well i remember it okay you know so there were times where i pa either passed him on the road or saw him out right. um i just wondering like how that went down with the with the coming and going through town there so you're back to the tire shop days so you're back at this tire shop automotive place you're gambling like crazy yeah and, uh, you, know, you know, like I just mentioned before with the sex, you need more and more and more. I needed more and more in gambling. You know, like, you know, my bets, when I first started gambling, I was betting five, ten dollars playing hands of blackjack. Now I'm betting hundreds of dollars for, on a hand of blackjack. Wow. And I couldn't wait for the weekends to get, to get here, to go to the casino. I needed action throughout the week because I got to keep... You know, I got to keep myself distracted 24-7, Nick. So I get hooked up with sports betting through the mob from a, from a local bar. And within six months of sports betting, you know, they, the bar owner, you know, like I took friends with me to go gamble and they would see me win 50,000, 70,000, 100 plus thousand. And they would go back and tell everybody like Clark's out of his mind. He won, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it spread around, you know, that I'd won. I didn't go brag about my winnings, but my buddies would go tell everybody. So the bar owner told the mob guy about, you know, my winnings. So they gave me a, uh, an, 
an open bet with no ceiling. I could bet as high as I wanted. As they know times. you're going to lose it eventually and yeah. they get their money. So, yeah. And within six months, I was bankrupt. I had to declare bankruptcy. And not only that, but I was in debt to the mob for 77000 Damn. And that was hell, bro. That was like some of the, that was some of the worst time. You know, you could say, oh, the, the rape must have been the worst time of your life. I don't know. The, getting in debt to the mob was pretty, pretty bad too. You, know? you paid them back apparently because you're still here. Well, that's a long, that's a, that's a long story. But, uh, you know, I, I even had the FBI call me at the tire shop and say, uh, Mr. Fredericks, uh, this is special agent, blah, 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 with the FBI. Um, I'm coming to your shop on Thursday at 3 p.m. You have to be there. And I'm like, whoa, bro. <laughs> I'm like, I like, you got to tell me what this is about. I can't discuss anything over the phone. I'll see you Thursday at 3 p.m. And he hangs up. And I'm like, what the hell was that? And I'm like, was that really a FBI agent or is mm. it like, right. So he shows up and proceeds to tell me that they have a confidential informant inside one of the major crime families who relayed to them that a hit had been put out of my life for my gambling debt. And he's like, uh, uh, you know, we're obligated if we hear of such, you know, uh, such things that we have to tell the potential victim about it. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was an insane period of my life and, and it went on for months with the FBI or with the, uh, mob threatening me and nothing ever happened. And I had not known what to do. I wasn't going to cooperate with authorities, uh, you know, on this, the mob asked me to wear a wire and I was like, are you nuts i'm like absolutely not so i didn't know what to do so i called gamblers anonymous and i told the lady on the phone the situation i was in and she had the head of gamblers anonymous for new jersey ed looney call me back personally within a half hour he called me back and he said there's there's a uh, meeting at a va hospital tonight in bedminster new jersey i'll meet you there there's some hardcore guys that go to this meeting they had been in the mob they had been involved with the mob they'll know how to handle this let's meet there so they they detailed a plan for me uh, um and they told me i have to stick to this plan a payment plan the mob didn't want to hear about a payment plan especially on that size money mm -hmm. and when when nothing when it just went away like the last conversation excuse me, I had with, with, with the mob guy was, you're a dead man, Fredericks. That was the last, and he hung up. That was the very last phone call. And, you know, I'm on a heightened state of awareness 24 seven and nothing ever happened. And the guys in the meeting said, this is probably what happened. I'm calling in my bets to a boiler room. They're like, these are just guys, these aren't made men in the boiler room these are just guys maybe associates maybe not even associates just working this boiler room and when they have a heavy hitter better like you they probably didn't turn your bets into the boss there's a mm. book they have to write everything down in they were probably keeping your bets for themselves so they're not hired killers the guys in this room the the boss that they're turning the bet sheet in has the hired killers. So they can't go to the boss to do anything to you because they never turned your bets boss. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Their, their, their own life is on the line. So all they could do was threaten you for, for a while. And then that was all they had up their sleeve. So I, I you know, and the, the informant probably worked in that boiler room. Hmm. And, you know, probably, you know, heard these guys say, you know, we're going to kill Fredericks, but they're not, they weren't killers themselves. So that's probably what happened. Interesting. Yeah. So you're just kind of going from one lifestyle extreme to another, like latching on to something else. Yeah. Yeah.
when did the when did the worst partying start well I went into my 40s and uh you know abuse victims suffer from PTSD and PTSD can rear its ugly head at any moment in your life you know I don't know what triggered my PTSD I never knew I was afflicted with it uh learning about it now uh I know that I was and I know that I am um and I went into my 40s and hit a huge depression hmm. and I you know just just getting out of bed in the morning was like climbing Mount Everest you know talking to myself like a baby come on Clark swing your legs out off the bed come on stand up come on walk to the bathroom come on pick a pick that toothbrush up and brush your teeth come on you can do it and not knowing how to fight what I was feeling I began drinking early in the morning on my way to work instead of pouring coffee in my travel mug I would make a mimosa like oh you know a little alcohol will will cheer me up and again these are all this is another boundary you know like I, I mentioned boundaries before to you you know getting in debt seventy-seven thousand dollars to the mob that was obviously within one of my boundaries I didn't want to do you know <laughs> declaring bankruptcy was another boundary I had no intention of crossing over <clears throat> what was your brother who you're working with like <laughs> how was he in all of this was he like what the are you doing well the guys at that gamblers anonymous meeting they said you know they told me they're like look these guys are going to contact your family members and hit them up for the money I'm like how are they going to do that they're like trust me they have ways they'll put pressure on people they'll find out how to get a hold of your family sure enough my brother got a call at his store from one of the mob guys and said your brother's a piece of shit who owes us a lot of money if you want to save his life you better pony up some money for us and I had already went to my family members and had to explain everything and be like look you could get contacted you just tell them that it's my problem and that I'm trying to handle it like a man with them that's all you got to say uh and then my father was you know very ill he would die a short while later uh but they called him when he was you know in really bad health and uh they they said the same thing to him you know if you want to save your son's life you better uh you better pony up some money for us wow and it really scared everybody in the family you know everybody was on high alert you know it was uh you know it was a really really shitty time in my life you know and it was tough it was tough on everybody in the family hmm. yeah so I go into my 40s I hit this wall of depression I start drinking before work I working in the tire business I'm working on backhoes backhoe tires loader tires truck tires where you got to split rings you got to beat them apart so you're back there doing the, the physical labor it's not just you're not up in the front office no I'm not you know we had two stores after after 10 years we closed the one store and then I went to work at my brother's store and I you know I would do some of the uh physical labor and I herniated my disc mm. in my back and I went and saw a doctor and he gave me Vicodin 30 Vicodin and uh I I gobbled those things up and absolutely loved them it made me feel you know like I was 17 again and uh and thus when the doctor wouldn't give me any more pills I just went on the street and started finding them and uh you know him telling me you know no I'm not giving you anymore wasn't an answer for me you know so now you know so I go from sex in my 20s gambling in my 30s to now all of a sudden drugs are starting to just you know they're starting to dig their way into me and then I'm so tired I'm so exhausted from the depression going to work and this is over the course of years now that my mind says well you know maybe we should just do a couple bumps of cocaine throughout the day to get us through the day what's so you know harmful about that so I start doing cocaine uh just to get me through my days just to stay energized 
And so now I'm drinking before work, taking my mimosa, you know, my drive to work. And your little travel mug. Yeah, I got my travel mug. You know, I got my my Vicodins I'm popping. Uh, you know, I got a Coke I'm, you know, doing uh, bumps of here and there. And that's how I'm living for years, man. You're spending a lot of money on drugs. Uh, that, yeah. I, once that started, yeah. Like, you know, I wasn't wasting money on gambling anymore. So, you know, I had money, you know, to spend on drugs. But I'm also selling pills, too. Okay. You know, and... So you got a little higher up the food chain. You're just not out buying little sacks with three or four Vicos in them. You're buying and selling. Oh man, I I I I was with a girl for a little while who had a uh, a pharmacist in Pennsylvania, who she was friends with his wife, and he would get us bottles of 500 Vicodins. Wow! So we're buying 500 Vicodins at a clip. Um, and then plus other people, you know, I was like a squirrel gathering nuts for the winter. You know, the, when you have an opiate addiction, you need more and more and more, you know, what you could do yesterday, it doesn't do anything for you tomorrow. You need, you need to add on to that. So over the course of time, my pill use went from a few pills a day up, depending on the strength, I could be taking two dozen pills. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, it was crazy. So yeah, so I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm selling pills also. Later on, I, I would sell cocaine too, like as I was doing more and more. So I'm living like that for years, Mick. With, with doing bumps of coke, taking my pills, drinking. And one day after work in a, in a deli, I'm making a coffee and in comes Dennis Pegg, my abuser. It's been 30 years since he abused me. And yet I instantly go into a panic attack and see what, what was different. I've seen him over the course of time, like I mentioned earlier, a couple of times. But what was different this time is he walked in with a young boy by his side who was calling him the same nickname he used to insist I call him. And the kid was about the same age I got raped at, you know, within a couple of years. What was that? And nickname? I heard that nickname. I saw that young boy. I saw Dennis. And before I just went into a full blown panic attack, I ran out of the deli. I ran out of the deli. I hopped in my truck. I sped out of the parking lot. And my life really like collapsed after that. Um, it opened up all my wounds. It put Dennis Pegg front and center in my mind. And I couldn't shake him. And now I'm already, you know, having my mimosa on the way to work and my pain pills and doing some coke. I'm already depressed. I'm already having a hard time swinging my legs out of bed in the morning. And after seeing Dennis, I just couldn't do it anymore. Within a few months, I walked out of the business I was in with my brother and I never looked back. So now I've got free time on my hands. My, my pain from inside has been ripped open. And I got Dennis Pegg front and center in my mind. And I was extremely distraught. I didn't know what to do. I only had, you know, destructive coping mechanisms. So I dove headfirst into drugs and alcohol, just trying to drown him being in my mind and drown the pain I was experiencing. And again, Mick, I, I keep mentioning boundaries. I could not live within boundaries. Another boundary for me was I would never, ever, 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 ever do heroin. And yet when you have an opiate addiction, I, I was doing, I couldn't even really get high from pain pills anymore. 
I would have to take so many of them to get high. I thought for sure I had re restless leg syndrome. My legs ached like you would not believe. And I could never keep my legs still. I'd always have to twitch them nonstop. And I thought I had restless leg syndrome. It turns out I was, whenever you're in a withdrawal from opiates, the, your legs kill you and you got to twitch them. Mm. Yeah, I didn't put two and two together because I'm still taking pain pills, but I wasn't taking enough to make my legs not hurt. And when my pain pills started getting harder to come by, somebody said to me who I asked for pills, they're like, look, I don't have any pain pills, but I can get you dope. And it's a lot cheaper and a lot more effective. And I was just like, screw it, man. Get me, get me some uh, wax folds of uh, heroin. And then that, thus I started doing heroin, you know? So, Drugs will target How did you consume people. the heroin. What's that? How were you consuming the heroin? Uh, I, I didn't get again, you know, <laughs> shooting heroin is is another boundary I'll never cross. Right. So I was just snorting it at the time. But just like everything else, I would eventually have gotten to that point since I couldn't live within any boundary. So I was I was just snorting it. So I'm snorting heroin. I got pain pills. Instead of buying a gram or two of Coke here and there every couple of days, I started buying ounces of Coke. And that's where I started selling Coke. So I would I would get two ounces of Coke, you know, sell one, have the other one for myself. And now I'm literally doing like cocaine around the clock. How how would you fall asleep at night? Yeah, I I mean I I also was taking a hell of a lot of Xanax um, just to try to, you know, moderate myself with the Coke. But sleep was uh, sleep was really non-existent for me for for quite a while. I would go week after week with single digit hours of sleep. How like just thinking about it, you're doing a bunch of heroin, which makes you fall asleep and be like a dope. And you do cocaine to like fire you up throughout the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when you were off hours, you'd snort the heroin and then like yeah, the I'd, I'd mix it in with the coke, you know, just snort them together. Wow. Yeah. So you know, like my heart's saying, "Do you want us to slow down? Do you want us to speed up?" You know, and you gotta you gotta take into account. I also had open heart surgery as a young. Yeah. Kid, you know? And uh, I really pushed the limits. You know, there was many a night. I, you know, I posted, you know, I'm clean and sober now. And during one of my anniversaries of being clean, I posted on Facebook or I posted Facebook and Instagram about all the drugs I was mixing at the same time. You know, uh, the Xanax and Valium with Coke and heroin and, and lots of uh, vodka. And somebody replied, you're full of shit. You're doing a disservice to anybody with addiction problems. They're going to think the drugs you're mentioning, that's a cocktail of death, it's called. You can't put all those together. And one of my friends who knew me back then, he replied to that person, if anything, Clark is underestimating the amount of drugs he was taking. So I don't know how I survived, Mick. It's not something I'm, you know, like pounding my chest about, you know. Uh, I get that. I know you're not bragging. Yeah, What's interesting, yeah. so you talk about anxiety and panic attacks and things like that. Like I've suffered from anxiety I'm, uh, since I was a teenager. And I'm currently not. But just hearing that, man, it makes me like, oh, f gives me like a little anxiety thinking about you on all those drugs and i'm thinking about here's a guy that had open heart surgery yeah. and on all these drugs your heart probably freaking pounding out of your chest laying there all sweaty constipated <laughs> <laughs> you're constipated from the opiates so you need the cocaine which makes you crap you know so it's just like i'd be like you know i, I would like laugh to myself i'd be like well I'm, i don't feel like doing coke today 
but I'm bound up from all the opiates I'm doing. So I got to do a little just so I can crap. <laughs> I'd be like, so I'm only going to do this cocaine. I'm telling myself this. I'm only going to do the cocaine today for medical reasons, just so I can go to the bathroom. And then once I go to the bathroom, I'd be like, ah, why should I stop now? Let's just keep going for the rest of the night, you know? Wow. And, then, wow. and then it would, so, you know, mornings or nights became irrelevant. I was just going, you know, my and sleep, my sleep okay. has always been off my whole life because of the abuse, because of the PTSD. And so is it still, can you go to sleep like last night? I have a hard sleep? time. Uh, I can fall asleep, but like now, now I got, uh, I got peeing problems. So I'm up, you know, three, four times a night peeing all that. So I get two hours. I get, you can set your clock two hours. Clark will be awake having to pee two hours. Get two that hours. prostate check, bro. Yeah, I've had that. Yeah. All right. All right. Side yeah. note, side note. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you've got relationships at this point in your life. Cause like these people are commenting. So you're hanging out and I don't want to demean your friends, but you're hanging out with people that are partying like pretty hardcore too. Yeah. 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 You know, I had a girlfriend towards the end. She just thought she didn't do coke. Go figure. Like she's with a guy doing all these drugs and I never like let her into that. She just thought I was a wild man. You know, she just thought I was crazy and she thought I was, you know, funny and cool to hang out with. Um, you know, I got friends I'm partying with. I went to one of my buddies' houses two weeks before what I'm about to share with your audience, you know, where my life really, you know, took a took a sidetrack before my life completely derailed. Two weeks before my life completely derailed, I showed up at my buddy's house really out of my mind. And when I left there, he called, you know, one of our other friends and was like, man, Clark was just here. He's like, really? Like, what the do we do with him? He's like taking it to a whole nother level. You know, so they, you know, like, you know, I, I knew some guys like that growing up and you, you kind of just had to like, let him go. Yeah. He, you know, like, other than telling me like, dude, you're like, you know, you're really, you're really taking it to a new level. You know, like if, if they were going to try to get too hard with me, I'd just avoid them. You know, right. Like, I was avoiding everybody at that point. Anyway, when you're doing that much drugs, you, you know, uh, you can't be, you know, you, you, you isolate yourself and lock yourself in your house and, you know, so how, uh, how was your, your physical health? I know, doing tons of drugs you're not healthy i mean did you like right now you look like you exercise a little bit you lift some weights yeah yeah yeah, yeah. did you do any of that shit then i mean it would uh, i would guess no 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 i'm just i'm just on that locomotive train you know flying down the tracks and you know headed like, to, to death yeah you know the the did you want to die yeah i didn't care you know i didn't care like there was many nights where you know i couldn't remember you know like you know my heart's beating out of my chest from all the coke and i'm like how many xanax did i take already how much how many pain pills have i put into my system with all the vodka i'm drinking i'm like i can't remember what i took should i take more xanax should i take more pain pills am i gonna overdo it and i'd just be like whatever f you know and pop another xanax and another couple bike it in and Jeez. uh and and be like I, I don't know if i'll wake up in the morning you know i don't know uh if i'll see the light of day you know and it's a uh, testament to the strength of the human body yeah you know there's and, and there's there's other people that you know maybe try coke one time and have a heart attack you know right uh, so uh i don't know why me you know and not somebody else die you know why'd somebody else die and not me you know i got you know i have i have faith in a higher power and uh, i have to believe you know so that i could be here to steer people down a different path than the one i took you know i did everything wrong nick the path i took is not the path to take the path to take is to speak out about your abuse to get therapy to get clean you know, I, I did everything wrong and, and, you know, up. So if you take, 
all the abuse victims that I've heard from, up to this point in my life, we've all, you could fill in pretty much any of their stories right into my story. Up to this point, the abuse, the self-destruction, using sex, using drugs, using gambling, using whatever vice to distract yourself from your pain. So our stories all fit into that box. Every abuse victim. What happened next is what different differentiates me from everybody else is. And when I was using all those drugs, like people have to understand it wasn't for a long, 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 long time. It was from basically the first of the year of 2012 until June. You were partying more than you should have for years. Right. I mean, most, most human beings drink some beer, wine, or mixed drink from time to time. And that is drugs or medic self-medication, but you were still, you're doing shit throughout all those years, but then you got kind of off the rails is what you're saying. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm functioning through my whole life. You know, I'm working, I'm going out with my friends, I'm dating, but it was from the first of the year of 2012 to June, where I really just, you know, went gung-ho overboard and didn't really give a f if I lived or died. Um, so it was, you know, like a five-month period. Uh, and I knew I couldn't, I couldn't last much longer living like that. You know, there was many, like I said, there was many a nights where I thought, you know, this will be it. I won't even wake up in the morning, you know. Um, so in 2012, June of 2012, I awake after a couple hours of sleep. I had been on a three-day bender. I crashed for a couple hours. I woke up, had to pee. I did a line of Coke. I poured a, a glass of wine. I got back in bed. I put on the TV and it's... On the news is the start of the Jerry Sandusky molestation trial out at Penn State. Sandusky was, I think he was the defensive coach. And he was running a boys camp where he'd been molesting boys for decades. And that just like, that just triggered me that day. I spent the rest of the day out with some friends drinking. I was sneaking my Coke throughout the day, popping Xanax. I had a friend coming over that night who was going to be power washing and staining the cedar siding of my house. And he was going to drop off the equipment so he could start the next day. And I ran into a guy who burned me on a business deal years prior. On my way home, I stopped at this Italian restaurant to have a glass of wine. It was near my house. And that guy who burned me on the business deal is in the restaurant. And he and I had words. And I left there all pissed off and inflamed and fired up. I get home. I'm telling my buddy about, I meet my buddy at the house. We get the equipment out of his van. We sit down at the table, we have a glass of wine, and I'm telling him about seeing this guy. And he says to me, that guy has to be number one on your hit list. And I'm like, before I could stop the words, Mick, I had never up to this point mentioned anything about my abuse to anyone. And before I could control my mouth, I was, you know, so diluted with drugs and alcohol and lack of sleep. The words just came out. He's actually number two on my hit list. The piece of shit who raped me as a kid is number one. And there it's out. First time in my life. And within 15 minutes, me and my buddy decided to go drive to this guy's house to confront him. What did your friend say when you told him that? There was dead silence, and he's just staring at me. And he's like, are you for real, bro? Or are you with me? I'm like, oh, I'm not like it, bro, I'm for real. And he's like, who is he? Who was he? I'm like, he was my Boy Scout leader. And he's like, what age did this happen? Where, who, where does he live? Where did he live? And I'm like, hey, he was, you know, I told him the quick synopsis. He was a lieutenant in the sheriff's department. 
He lives three miles from here. And, you know, it's debatable which one of us came up with the notion to go confront them, but whoever, you know, whoever said the words, within 15 minutes, we're in his van driving to the guy's house. I didn't know if he still lived there. I don't know if he has roommates. I don't know. I don't know anything. So what time of day was it? It was nighttime. This is 930 at night. Okay. In the summer, June. So we parked, he has a long driveway. We parked halfway up the driveway. I got out to run up to the house to see, you know, if he was still living there. His front door was open. He had a storm door that was shut. And I looked through the storm door and there he is sitting there watching TV. And I instantly became that 12 year old kid again. I instantly went into a panic attack. I could feel the muscles within me tightening up. I, I, you know, when he touched me when I was a kid, I got like paralysis and that would drive me nuts as an adult that I froze like that and become paralyzed by his touch. And I felt that feeling coming over me again. And before I became paralyzed in his driveway, I marched up to his storm door. I ripped it open. I broke it off the hinge and This guy was such a whack, whack job. He, it's 930 at night. A, a childhood rape victim of his just rips open his storm door. And he looks over his shoulder and set, puts his hand up and says, hey, how are you? Like, the dude didn't like beg for mercy. He didn't plead. He didn't get on his hands and knees and say, Clark, I'm so sorry for what I did. I'm sick. I, 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 I can't believe what I did to you and other boys. Forgive me. I need help. None of that. Hey, how are you? And that just set me off. I go, hey, how am I? Let me show you how the I am, Dennis. And I raced across his living room. I had a knife in my hand. I started stabbing at him. He started punching me. A violent struggle went on for a couple minutes, Mick. And at the end of it, he fell down on the ground. He was up against the wall. And I knelt down in front of him and I said, it's not so fun raping little boys now, is it? And I slit his throat. And that was the end. So you went to the door with a knife in your hand. I had a knife. Now, I said to my friend, we ought to take something to protect us because this guy is a gun. Dennis was the firearms instructor for the Morris and Sussex County law enforcement. So that's two counties that adjoin each other. He was the firearms instructor. So when I don't know if it's every year, or every two years, you have to get recertified for your firearms here in New Jersey. I forget sure. now. You had to go to Dennis. This guy, this guy had over three dozen uh, guns and rifles and shotguns in his house. He had bayonets. He had dozens of knives. And yet he didn't have any of those at the ready for a victim coming to see him. He'd mm -hmm. been doing this for 40 plus years, ruining lives. And yet he, thought he was untouchable. He should have had a gun taped under every table, taped to the couch, taped to the chair, and yet he had nothing. And yet he had over three dozen firearms in this house. Small little house. I know that in your trial, you talked about a lot of this, but did you go there with that knife in your hand and to do what you did or did it just turn into that? No, nah, it just turned into that. You know, I you can say it either way. It's my friend and I, and, and then this is the honest truth. You know, my friend and I did not sit at the table and say, "All right, let's go there. Let's rip rip his door open. Let's go in, stab him, and blah 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 blah." It was let's go confront this piece of shit. And I say this guy's a gun fanatic. You know, I knew he was. I didn't know he was still the firearms instructor. I knew he had been. I go, he's got guns everywhere. We ought to take something. 
So I gave my buddy a steak knife and I took my hunting knife. So like a straight bladed hunting yeah, knife? Great knife. And in the attack, I had even put the knife straight through my hand and severed all the ligaments and tendons in my hand. Accidentally, of course. Yeah, he 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 punched me got with a solid right. I was falling backwards. I grabbed his shirt with my left hand to keep me from falling down. And when I got my balance back, I just said, you m And I brought the knife down and I went right through my hand. How, how old was he on this day? He was in his 60s. And I'm 45. And, and, and don't, let, don't let age fool you. He was a big, big dude. He was, you know, I, I wasn't looking at it like that. I just was thinking about for context for the listeners. So former Special Operations Army guy, lifelong copper. Big hulking guy. Mm -hmm. Hulk, you know, when he raped me, 250, 260, jacked. You know, he's, he's a big, just one of those guys with big, those big meaty hands, mm. you know, he was that type of dude, a big bulky guy. You slit his throat. Do you close your eyes and see that? I mean, that's pretty intense. <laughs> that's like, um, I mean, that's the shit out horror movies, man. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't, uh, to be honest, to be honest with you, it doesn't torment me No. And I don't think knowing what I know from talking with you, hearing you talk about it, I don't, it, it sounds horrible, but it needed doing in some ways. Yeah. I, you know, this, this is a tricky part here. Um, you know, first off, everybody wants to ask me, which you didn't, but everybody wants to know, did, did murdering him solve all your problems? Well, I know it wouldn't, so I wouldn't ask no. it. <laughs> <laughs> but like everybody, it. You know, when I do speeches and I take Q&A at the end, I always get, did, did killing, killing your monster solve all your problems? And I'm like, no, like, no, it didn't solve my problems. It, do you know the amount of problems it just added to my life by, by doing that, Nick? You know, it's just like. Did you guys, did you guys try to hide anything? No, no, no. Um. The only, the, like what, know, the happen, police. what happened what happens next so you, you well the you, police asked me because nothing was but wait before it. before we even get there so you're still in this dude's living room you've stabbed yourself this. okay all right yeah the police asked me what were the bloody footprints going from the crime scene over to the bedroom for you know because i i and i'm like i walked to the bedroom and spit on the bed where he raped me and they're like oh okay because nothing was touched. We wondered why your footprints went to that, that bedroom. So I spit on the bed where he raped me. And then I, I walked out of the, uh, out of the house and my friend, uh, I was bleeding profusely from my wound. I told my buddy, let me go inside. When we got back to my house, I said, I got to get some, some paper towels, some bandage. And when I went inside, he took off down the driveway. And that's the last I saw him. Like uh, ever? Uh, I haven't seen him since. I that was, talked that to was him. 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I talked so, to him one time. So he didn't get drugged into the legal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He got arrested the next day as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they really wanted to, they wanted to fry him because he didn't really have a reason to go there. You know, he wasn't abused by the guy, you know, so they, they have what's called queen for a day. And, you know, it's a legal term where, where the prosecutor wants you to answer questions that can't harm you in the case. And it's called queen for a day. You get to be queen for a day. We get to ask you whatever we want. You get the answer without it, you know, coming back to be used against you. And I said to my lawyer, why would I ever do that? Why would I hand him the case on a silver platter now? And, uh, and my lawyer is like, well, they really want your co-defendant. They, they, you know, they want to hear why he was there. And I'm like, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to be queen for today. He's like, I, I don't, I wouldn't do it either. 
So I never was queen for today, but they throughout my years of being incarcerated, they kept asking me to be queen for today, be queen for today. So you leave. Yeah. You're in this horrific scene. You spit on the bed. You're bleeding. You split. You go home. You bandage yourself up. And then what happens? Yeah, I mean. Had you, had you ever had legal problems before besides DUI? Did you ever get no. busted selling dope or anything? No. No, never was arrested. Okay. Um, and that DUI wasn't even on my record now, you know. Okay, because you were a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, when when I, you know, so I, I get arrested the next day. Um, I woke up, you know, it, and it, it came out to the police. My, my mother was up from Florida. I woke her up. I knew my life was over because of an injury I had. And I told her, uh, I go, I just flushed my life down the toilet, mom. I had to take care of something for myself and a whole bunch of other people. And uh, I got this injury. It's going to be my downfall. I know it is. And uh, I said, I took care of Dennis Pegg. And she's like, what do you mean you took care of Dennis Pegg? I'm like, Dennis Pegg is no more. He's never going to hurt another kid. He's, he doesn't exist anymore. And she's like, I don't understand. What are you, what are you, what are you saying? What are you, what are you, you know, she, she, you know, she, she had no idea. It was, it was a lot for her to take in. And she contacted my sister early in the morning while I was sleeping and said, I, I, I you know, she wouldn't talk over the phone. My sister lives over an hour away. My mother called her five o'clock in the morning. It was like, you have to get to the house right now, immediately. And she wouldn't tell her why. My sister got there. And then my mother said, your brother said he killed Dennis Pegg last night. And my sister goes, well, we have to call the police. And my mother, my mother, God bless her, is like, we are not getting the police involved. No. <laughs> my sister's like, mom, we can't be part of a murder investigation. Maybe he's not even dead. Maybe he's just wounded. Maybe, maybe Clark is so out of his mind on drugs, he doesn't even know what he's saying right now. Let's go back a second to yeah. when you were a kid. I remember you telling me that your father once asked you if anything, if Dennis ever hurt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we glanced over a lot of stuff because, um, you know, the right. I just want to I want to make sure. So so your mom, did she have any recollection of that from 30 years, 25 years previous? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, you know, told her then I lied to you guys all those years. Nah, ago, I, didn't, I didn't say that that night. But, you know, uh, I said, you know, you, you, you know, what, what happened is Dennis proclaimed himself to be the mentor of children in our county. And he would take the young drug addicted boys, young men, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, who were getting released from jail. He would offer them a place to get their life back on track by staying with him. I'll mentor you. I'll get you on track. So he's taking, he's waiting outside the jail for these inmates to get released, taking them back to his house, and then in the middle of the night, pouncing on them. And how many did he sexually abuse versus how many ran out of there? I don't know, but some ran out of there. And in the middle of the night, they're hitchhiking through the little town of Stillwater. And when they get picked up, they're telling the residents, this friggin' animal offered me a place to get my life back on track. And in the middle of the night, he's on top of me grabbing my penis and, and naked and, and trying to rape me. So that spread like wildfire. And yet nothing was ever done. And my father heard the rumors, and that's where he sat me down the first time. And it happened to be about a year after I was raped. And he said, did, he told me the story about the inmates and he said, Dennis Pegg ever touch you? I said, no, daddy never touched me. I just couldn't bring myself to, to say the words to him. And then the same thing happened about another year or two later, probably two years later, a classmate of mine in my grade, in the Boy Scouts, his mother was a waitress at a, a, a Dunkin' Donuts. My father was in there having a coffee and she told my father how Dennis Pegg raped her son. My father came home again and said, sat me down 
And this time he said, son, before you answer my question, I just want you to know, you will never have to go to the police. You'll never have to testify. You'll never be in court. You'll never step foot into a police station. I will take care of Dennis Pegg myself. You just tell me if he ever touched you. And, you know, as tempting as that was, Mick, it was too much weight to put, you know, in my mind for weeks, I'm thinking, all right, my father is either going to go beat Dennis up. He's going to go murder him. What if it doesn't go right? What if he gets killed? What if he has to spend life in prison? It was just, it was too much for me at that age. And I, so again, I told him, no, dad, he never touched me. So there was those incidences and, uh, and the, there were stories, you know, always, you know, swirling around town about him, you know, later on when Dennis retired from the sheriff's department, he became a park ranger at Stokes state forest. And there was the same type of rumors. Dennis became a trail angel. The Appalachian trail ran right, ran right through there. And Dennis became a trail and angel. Trail angels, you know, you have the time frame when hikers are supposed to come through your area. And he would hand out waters and candy bars. But he would say, why don't you come home with me? And I'll, I'll make you a hot meal, give you a bath. Ah, bingo. And the same exact thing would happen. Um, they would run out in the middle of the night. There was also a lot of, there was a, not a lot, but there was a bunch of the hikers who left messages, you know, uh, uh, about him after his death, about what a great guy he was, how much they loved him. So what was his relationship with, with those hikers versus the other hikers who ran out of his house and hitchhiked? And, and said to the residents picking them up, you know, I, I've been hiking through the Appalachian Trail and, and this guy told me to come home for a hot meal and he pounced on me. People said nice things about John Wayne Gacy, too. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and nothing, though, nothing ever happened to Dennis. He got he got the blind eye from law enforcement. You know, every everybody knew stories about him, but nothing was ever done. Other kids ever, did kids ever come out? He got out from three, got out from under three uh, criminal investigations where charges were filed. Um, the kid I mentioned, whose mother was the waitress in the Dunkin' Donuts, they filed charges. He systematically, the mother worked the graveyard shift at Dunkin' Donuts. And Dennis, would go there and sit at the counter in the middle of the night with nobody else in there and threaten her and threaten her son if they didn't pull the charges he would kill them both they eventually dropped the charges two other cases that the prosecutor dug up you know everything was handwritten back then they had to go through boxes of files yeah and they found two cases where boy scouts went on the weekend jamborees and came home and had hickeys all over their body. And the parents saw them without their shirt on and saw all these, you know, purple lesions and like, what the hell is that? And they said, that's from Dennis Pegg. Two families went to the state police, filed charges at, at various times. This isn't at the same time. And a, a mother took her son there. They filed charges. The next day, the father went and and took the charges, you know, recanted the charges and said, I don't want my son being labeled as gay. We're not we're not going forward with this. And then the other family filed charges and then eventually dropped it because they said our son's too traumatized to testify. I have a very dear friend who was abused as a young boy. And to this day, as a grown man, I know there's some animosity. He's probably not even a, a strong enough or correct word. I don't know what is, but it, that was sort of his parents' response when he told them what happened to him was, we don't want people to think 
you know, that we're a family that's this kind of shit happens to my words, not his. Right. And you think about how often that happens where I think in the big scheme, they're probably trying to do what's right. We just make this all go away. And, but not thinking about the long horrible. ramifications. Yeah. Horrible, and, horrible. And, and, you know, and that's why, you know, that's why I don't mind speaking out now, Mick. Um, you know, one, it's good for me to speak about it, you know, uh, and two, there was nobody that spoke about this crap when I was a kid. So I just don't want people to feel alone in the world who have been abused. Like, so I put my, my, my shit out there and, uh, just so people don't feel like they're the only, I felt like this was never talked about. There was Catholic priests were never talked about in the seventies or eighties. Boy Scout right. leaders were never talked about. It's only in the last five to 10 years that it started trickling out. And uh, up until that, you know, I felt alone in the world. Like nobody else could understand what I went through. Well, yeah. now that I've spoken out, I get nonstop messages every day. So people in the same thing, people feel isolated and alone with it. So, you know, they need somebody to speak out. Yeah. So cops, you're home, you call your sister, your, your mom, your sisters gets involved, you're bleeding, your hands all bandaged, you need legitimate medical attention. So, you know, when I go to the hospital, doctor's going to see me and know what something bad. Yeah, you happened. can't go in like with that wound I had and, and just like, you know, make something up, you know. Um, so my sister calls her therapist and says, I don't know what to do. And the therapist says, well, you, you got to call the cops. Got to do a well-being check. You know, you could save your your brother from potentially being charged with murder if the guy's not dead or if the, nothing happened to him, you know, like. So the therapist called the state police and said, do a well-being check on this, this guy. They went there, find the body. I get up. Pop a couple Xanax. I'm like, I need a drink. I got to think about how I'm gonna how I'm gonna handle this. I go out to pour a glass of wine, and I look out the windows of my house, and there's at least a dozen cop cars up and down the road, probably probably more, you know, twenty of them. And there's cops running behind trees, running behind rock walls. Wow. And I'm just like, you gotta be, you gotta be kidding me. It's over already. Like before I could even think about what crafting a plan, it's right. done, dude. Right. You could have been in Mexico. <laughs> it's, it's over. <laughs> and that feeling, it, it's tough to even like recapture that feeling. It was just, uh, uh, you know, just like your gut just drops and uh, you just know your life is over. So I chugged a glass of wine. I poured a second glass and I heard out of a loudspeaker, you know, Mr. Fredericks, come out of your house with your hands up. And uh, I chugged that second glass of wine, and I was just hoping when I would step out onto my porch that one of those guys would shoot me. Like something would, something would trigger somebody, and, and a shot would ring out. And uh, you know, I just went out and I put my hands out at my sides. You know, I'm tilting my head back with my eyes closed, and I'm just like, "Please, God, let this be over right now." You know, I for I, I forfeited my life when I stepped out that front front door i'm like it's done it's done god like let's just you know let's just punch out of this and uh it's over and uh you know luckily no shot rang out and uh you know i i was ordered spread eagle onto my front lawn i was handcuffed and taken away to the state police barracks they didn't take you to the hospital no like you know uh people use duct tape for everything well, it also it also stopped my bleeding. You know, I put some paper towels and then wrapped it real tight with duct tape. But duct tape works wonders, bro. Mechanics way saves the day. <laughs> so that was June of 2012. June, the murder was June 12th. I got arrested on the 13th. Okay. Yep. It's my son's birthday. Oh, he, the 12th or 13th? 13th. 13th. So this turns into several years of court incarceration. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, you know, I had I had lost all hope when I got arrested. I'm like, it's over, it's done, you know, my life is over. And a lieutenant at the state police, um, he was in charge of the crime scene team that went to Dennis Pegg's house. And as soon as he walked into the crime scene and took a look at Dennis Pegg's face, he said to one of his team members, he goes, this is that creepy guy from the diner down the road. A bunch of the cops would go to this diner down the road and then, you know, have breakfast. And Dennis Pegg would come in, sometimes with a young boy, sometimes by himself. He's a member of law enforcement, and they all found it odd they that he knew. would never acknowledge any of them. He would just turn his head to the side and walk to the back of the diner. And they had all heard rumors, you know, like everybody else in town, they heard rumors that he was a, a predator. And yet nothing, nothing was done to stop him. And this guy came in, this lieutenant came into the holding cell at the state police barracks. And first words out of his mouth were, he said, I want to apologize to you. And I said, why are you apologizing to me? And he said, I've known about this scumbag for a long time. I've heard rumors. He goes, but I can't build a criminal case on rumors. I need victims. And whatever he did to you victims to keep you quiet, it prevented me from, from arresting him. And he goes, and I also want to apologize for whatever he did to you when you were a boy. And, uh, you know, at first it made me feel really good. But then after he left the room, I just, uh, I got really pissed that everybody around knew about Dennis Pegg and nobody ever stopped him. Like he mm. already had 40 years reign of terror. They attribute four or five suicides to him. His own nephew committed suicide after I got arrested and they found sexual provocative images on Pegg's computer of the nephew. Yeah. Um, so even family members weren't off limits and yet nothing was ever done to stop this guy. You know, uh, you know, so I, uh, again, I, after he left that holding cell, I said, you know, I said to myself, I had to just forfeit my life to stop this guy when everybody knew what this guy was doing and nobody, nobody could stop him. And yeah. I had to just forfeit them my life and then i was just like ah f whatever you know it's done it's over and um that that lieutenant came back into the holding cell a little while later you know they take you out they strip you naked they got to photograph you they got to have you turn 10 different ways they you got to reach up and reach out they got to get your arm length all of that and uh he came back in and he he said he took one look at me and something moved inside of him because he said he could tell that i had mailed it in he's like when i walked back in that second time you were done i could just tell you were done and he's like and something told me that i didn't want you your life to be over something told me to help you and he said to me, he's like, my own detectives are waiting in another room. In New Jersey, prosecutors are on the crime scene with the police. We're one of the few states where that's allowed. Normally the police do the investigation and then hand the file to the prosecutor. Here in Jersey, prosecutors are allowed to work with the police throughout the investigation. So at the state police barracks, there was prosecutor detectives there to interrogate me with the state police detectives and he goes there's detectives in the other room waiting to interrogate you they're going to pull you out of here in a minute or two if you go into that room and open up your mouth you're going to derail the whole rest of your life he goes you're in deep shit now we have you he goes there's there the case is pretty much sealed up but if you open up your mouth you could potentially derail the whole rest of your life. Do not go in there 
and speak. Go in there, request a lawyer, and exercise your Fifth Amendment rights. And he said, do you understand what I'm telling you? I said, I got it. And that's what I did. I walked in there and I said, you know, uh, they said, Mr. Fredericks, we want to ask you some questions uh, about uh, the events of June the 12th. And I said, uh, I request a lawyer. I'm not going to say anything without a lawyer present. And they said, is that really how you want to handle this? And I said, yes. And they said, all right, interview's over. And without him saying that to me, you know, because I had already mailed it in, I, I, I could have just gone in there and said a whole bunch of stupid shit that would have screwed me for the rest of my life. So instead, uh, you know, I was taken back to the holding cell and I, I, I felt my star self, I lost a lot of blood. I, I felt myself getting really like lightheaded and woozy, like I was ready to pass out. So I, I ripped the, uh, they left this, the hand that was damaged. They didn't uh, chain it to the wall. And I was able to rip the uh, duct tape off. And when that, when that Lieutenant walked back in, I showed him the injury I had. He said, holy smokes, dude. And uh, they went and called an ambulance after that. And then I was taken, I had an emergency surgery. And then from there, I was thrown into the uh, county jail, into a suicide room. And they kept me in a suicide room for three, four weeks. So I, and, and I tell people, this is how low I sunk, Nick. I was thrown into the jail where Dennis Pegg spent his whole career working. He was a sheriff's lieutenant working in the jail section. The, the sheriff's department is like split up into a couple sections. Mm -hmm. Those who are in the jail, those who are in the courthouse, and those who are out doing criminal investigations. Dennis Pegg worked the jail and was a lieutenant in there. And I thought for sure, since nothing had ever come about him molesting those inmates decades ago, I thought for sure they were going to give me the beating of a lifetime in there. And uh, one by one, one jail, you know, they got to do cell checks, come through and do a cell check. And one by one, you know, uh, jail guards are coming in and, and saying, look, you know, I didn't know this guy. I'm hearing a lot of a, a lot of dirt about him. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't open your mouth to any of us in here. Let it play out. The next guy would say something similar. The next guy came in and he said, can I get you anything? And I'm like, are you allowed a pillow in the suicide cell? I didn't have a pillow. And he's like, yeah, you can have a pillow. So he comes back with two pillows for me. And then, uh, and then, you know, days later, a jail guard I knew from the street uh, came into the cell and asked how I was doing. You know, I told him I was pretty shitty. And he said, uh, do you know do you know what's going on in the community? And I said, how would I know? And he's like, somebody started a free Clark campaign and there's bumper stickers on cars everywhere. He goes, shirts, bumper stickers, hats are being sold left and right. And I was like, really? They're like, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, it gave me a glimmer of hope. But I was still so horribly depressed. I just wanted to die for for a while. I was horribly depressed. And you're detoxing off of serious drug usage. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was. I was having hallucinations. I was seeing seeing stuff swirling around the suicide. Did you get any kind of treatment for that while in college? Yeah, the, you know, uh, they had there. There's a jail psychiatrist, and. Uh, I told her, you know, the uh, the number of Xanax I was taking and how I'm hallucinating now. And she said, you can't just stop taking Xanax like that. It can lead to seizures and coma and death. So she said, I'm I'm putting you back on Xanax. So she she put me back on Xanax while I was in there. So you were able to wean off of it over time. Yeah, 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 yeah. No o opioid withdrawals. Yeah, every yeah, I was misery in in that suicide cell. Man, it was okay. hell. Yeah. How long? How long were you 
in that space until you were able to get into like a regular jail situation well because of, i had a cast on my hand so they kept me in the suicide cell for like three four weeks and then they put me into an isolation cell for another three weeks until the cast came off because they said that that's considered a weapon we can't let you be in general population with that on so once they took that cast off then i got put into uh general population did you have a uh paid lawyer or public defender during my uh you know first week and a half in that suicide cell lawyers started coming to see me um how, how the people like just wanting to help you or family had sent them both like you know one contacted my family you know he was <laughs> yeah. he was this high profile guy he Want wore to a make lot a name of, for himself he wore he wore a lot of gold mm. he handled some big cases but when he came in like I knew guys who did cocaine like they always a lot of them touched their nose nonstop and I'm I'm sitting in the uh interview room with this guy and he's like nonstop you know like just touching his nose throughout the whole interview and I'm like this guy's got to be doing coke the last thing I'm going to do is hire uh, by a lawyer to defend me who's doing coke <laughs> so he was out of the picture this other lady from this real high profile law firm all her all her claim to fame was uh, I'll have you bailed out in three days. Hmm. And uh, she's like, just sign with me, sign the papers today, and you'll be out of here within three days. And I'm like, eh. and then this other guy came in and he was humble. And he told me, he goes, I think you have an excellent defense. I'm like, really? It's like, yeah. It was, he goes, I think uh, if we went to trial, I, I feel pretty good about our chances. I'm like, really? And I'm like, you're my guy. <laughs> so, and uh, he goes, he goes, uh, and where where that other lawyer wanted to get me bailed out in three days, he said to me, "You're not getting bailed out." He goes, "I want that notion to get right out of your head." He goes, "One, I don't know if you're a suicide risk or not, and I'm not going to get you bailed out so you can commit suicide." Two you're addicted to drugs and alcohol I'm not getting you bailed out so that you can go back to using and three I don't think it looks good in a small community like this for a guy charged with murder to be going out to bars to be going out to restaurants he goes I just want you where you're at every day you serve now will get applied to whatever sentence you get so let's just keep you here and keep you safe from yourself and from your demons i'm like all right makes good sense yeah 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 and that's uh and that's you well know, that's why i went with him so the defense played out that you it wasn't self-defense right it wasn't a self-defense case well you weren't if you put yourself in that situation showing up to his house so how how did you end up you have how are to you not, how are you not on death row for stabbing a dude in the neck in his own home yeah you you have to pick a defense like if you're going to say not guilty you have to pick how you're defending yourself and we originally picked diminished capacity diminished capacity won't let you off of your charges but it will lower it can lower your sentence if you have if you get if you prove diminished capacity so we started with that. As time went on and we delivered our psychological, if you're gonna defend yourself, you have to deliver a psychological report to the prosecutor. And then the prosecutor has to get their psychiatrist, psychologist to do a report on you. They, they just can't go by what your psychologist says. So you need both sides to give a psychological report. And in that psychological report, it lays out everything. It's like where they wanted me to be queen for the day early on, three years later, when we handed in our psychological report, that had a lot spelled out. It had my abuse spelled out and it had details of the murder spelled out. When I did 
the prosecutor's psychological exam and report, and this is over the course of weeks, you know, several, several, I did so many psychological exams, taking so many tests, so many interviews, um, and the prosecutor or the prosecutor psychologist drafted his report that I fit in perfect to passion provocation, which is another defense. And passion provocation can let you off, whereas diminished capacity just brings down your sentence. Passion provocation can let you off. And this, my case, was the first time ever where passion provocation was used 30 years later. Hmm. Usually passion provocation is, you know, Mickey comes home to the garbage guy in bed with his wife and, and goes nuts and kills one of them. Right. That's passion provocation. But I there's four there's four factors to the passion provocation. And I fit in to all four. And like one of the things for passion provocation is you have to become inflamed. So I became inflamed for months leading up to the murder, seeing Peg, seeing Peg in that deli, seeing him with a boy, seeing the Sandusky trial on TV, running into that guy who burned me on the business deal. For the first time, breaking my silence to my friend, all inflaming me. One of the other things is there can't be a cooling down period. If there's a cooling down period, you don't fit into passion provocation. We were in my buddy's van within 15 minutes. If we had waited three hours and then drove, you don't fit into that. So I, I fit into the passion provocation. Um, and that, you know, that, that played a good part in it too. So you mentioned earlier, had I ever been involved with the police, like ever charged criminally? And I, you know, the answer is no. Uh, my lawyer put in a motion when we were going for the sentencing to have my charges downgraded to third degree charges. I took a plea from, I went from first degree murder, which is 30 to life, to second degree manslaughter, which is five to 10 years. Then my lawyer put in a motion to have me downgraded to third degree charges. If, and you can do that if, if the, the person being charged has never been involved with the law before. And you have to have uh, your mitigating factors outweigh your aggravating factors. And, you know, so the lawyer listed all my mitigating factors and they outweighed, you know, the aggravating factors. I go for sentencing. And, uh, you know, my lawyer had me prepared. He's like, you know, it's, it's going to be tough for a judge, you know, not to go to the high end of the sentencing, especially for a murder. So he's like, just be prepared for a higher number. And yet when I went to court for my sentencing, the judge, he goes, I'm tempted to liberate Mr. Fredericks right now. He was taking that motion into account. He goes, I understand that Mr. Fredericks only did what he did because of what was done to him as a child. And then he, he took long pauses. And then he said, I'm going to sentence Mr. Fredericks to the minimum five years. And I would just like to state that I'm sorry that I have to send you to prison for a single day. And there I, and there I got the minimum, five years, with the judge even apologizing for, for that. And how much time had you already served? I had served exactly three and a half. So I got sent to Northern State Prison in Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and I had to do another year. You know, they have since taken away uh, the 85% law. But if you had a violent crime, you have to do 85% of your sentence. I actually did three months longer than 85%. I should have been out in four years, three months. I did uh, a little over four, four and a half years. So you did end up in like a legitimate prison si system for a while where you weren't just in a county jail setting. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, where you did tons of therapy and counseling, right? Yeah. You know, uh, before you go to prison, you go, you had to get sent to a place called CRAF, C R A F. It's uh, central reception and forwarding. So every county, however many counties there are in New Jersey, 20 something, all their inmates from the county jails that are going to prison have to go to CRAF to get a psych exam, to get a medical exam, to get checked out for gang affiliation, and then they determine what prison to send you to. And you go before a classification board. So, and when I went before the classification board, first thing they said to me is, Mr. Fredericks, can you explain something to us? How in the world did you get five years for murder? We have never seen an inmate come before us who got five years for murder. So I went into like a quick one, two minute synopsis of what happened, who the guy was, what he did, yada, yada, yada. And they all like shook their heads at the end, nodded and said, I see. And the, the head guy of the classification panel said, uh, are you open to receiving therapy? And I said, absolutely. And they said, Northern State Prison has the best therapists out of all the prisons. If we send you there, will you get involved in therapy? And I said, absolutely. And they said, that's where we're going to send you. Um, you know, one, thera one prison has the best hospital in it. So if you have medical issues, they'll, they'll send you to that prison. Mm -hmm. um, another prison has the best job training opportunities for getting, you know, a trade. Another prison has the best schooling. You know, so Northern State had the best therapies, therapists. And uh, so I went there my very first day, therapist came to my cell and she said, I saw your case on the news. I followed it. I can't believe you're here. Will you start therapy with me? And I said, sure. You know, so uh, I had to go to prison to get therapy for the first time in my life. And as much of a hellhole as prison is, I got involved in group therapy for victims of childhood trauma. My therapist, my second one-on-one -on -one with her, she said, Clark, I also run a group therapy class for victims of childhood trauma. Will you join that? And I said, yes. So I'm in there with, with, with gang members, uh, different religions, Muslims, uh, different races, and we all are sharing our hellish childhoods in front of each other and crying in front of each other. Something you can't do in prison. You you can't go can't go around crying in prison. You know, um, but we were allowed to let our guard down in that therapy class, mm. and that was a that was that's something that I would never have gotten on the street was was something like that, and that was mm -hmm. the biggest therapeutical thing to to healing me. What do you say when people, because I've heard it like, ah, man, I'm good. Like I've read some books or, I, you know, at this point, I just don't think I need to go back to that space or I'm working through it on my, in my own way. Like, it, what do you say to people that say things like that? Yeah, you know, I, I did the therapy in prison. I got out of prison and I started therapy. And then I, I said, ah, I'm good. You know, I don't need, just like you said, I don't need this anymore. I did it for, I don't know, a year or two. And I'm like, ah, I don't need it. And so then I, I, I shied away from it for uh, another year or two. And then uh, I just had shit going on in my life. And, uh, and uh, you know, my trauma from my childhood would still rear its ugly head. Like how? Uh just, just the way I felt, the way I would feel unsettled. I'm doing speeches and I go into the character of the abuse victim. I go into the character of the being a murderer. 
And it would send me into horrible depressions after, after I would do these speeches. Like I would just, I would just crash. And uh, I had all these people reaching out to me about trauma therapy called EMDR. So I just, I was, I was starting to feel really down again. And uh, I found an EMDR therapist uh, in my uh, area. And uh, I, 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 you know, started uh, doing therapy with her. And what is it? uh, EMDR, you know, I've been back to therapy for 11 months and we haven't even actually done the EMDR therapy yet. You know, there's been enough stuff in my life that we've been dealing with. Um, and you have to do a good EMDR therapist will do a trauma timeline of the victim. Hmm. I've had other people say EMDR almost ruined me because the therapist I used didn't do a trauma timeline. They have to. I, I'm just reading here. There's a bunch of controversy on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's it's using uh, rapid eye movement while uh, like reliving some of your trauma and your trauma has my therapist uh, explained it. Your trauma is just floating around in you. It's never been processed. When you do your speeches, when you tell somebody about it, you you relive it and it feels like it's happening all over again. Mm. And she goes EMDR therapy will help process your trauma. And it's like your brain puts it into a file cabinet. It's not like it erases it from you, but your brain will file file it so that it's not just there ready to pounce on you when you relive it. So we're building up to that. We're almost at the stage uh, to begin it. Um, like I said, 11 months, I haven't even started it yet. You know, she, she takes a slow process and I've had, I've, I've had a lot of other shit go on in my life. Uh, so for anybody who says I'm good, uh, you know, I said the same thing and I wasn't good, you know, and I felt myself sink into depressions and I don't, I, I I've got too much stuff I want to accomplish that I, I, I can't be sinking into depression. And, you know, if I sink into depressions, I com I'm, I combated that in the past with drugs and alcohol. You know, I'm 10 years sober and clean, and uh, I just don't want to, I don't want to lose, lose that by being depressed and thinking I can combat it with drugs and alcohol. So it was about five years ago that you got out of jail? Yeah, uh, December 30th. So it's almost six years. December 30th, it will be uh, six years. Of, of 17? December 30th of 16. 16. Did you have anybody push back and say F this? I understand some bad shit happened to this dude when he was a kid, but you can't go around murdering people. Did uh, you have any pushback in the community? Not or in the community, no. No. Uh, if you look at soft white underbelly, let's say, mm -hmm. out of uh, sixty five hundred comments, there's maybe six to ten where people will be like, I don't care what he's done to help victims. He murdered somebody and that that'll never be all right in my book. And I, all I can say is I did everything wrong. I don't, I don't disagree with people that want to say that like, yeah. like, yeah, you I, can't have every abuse victim go out and murder their, their abuser. It, it, one, it doesn't, it, one, it didn't heal me. It's not going to heal them. Yes. I stopped. I stopped a horrible individual from committing any more crimes, but I, but I almost had to sacrifice my whole life for it. And I had to get so broken to go do that. And nobody else is going to get a five-year sentence for murder. Yeah. You're going to yeah. do life. And it, it, Mick prison life is, is shit. Even though I got therapy in there, it's complete shit. It's yeah. a, horrible, it's a horrible existence. So, so if you heal yourself instead, it should take away that desire to want to go kill your abuser. Do, do you, do, let me read, let me go back a sec. Did, did you have or exhibit violence in other ways? Like, did you get in fights and did you ever like 
get rageful and beat dudes up at bars or whatever? Like, did you have Not, did nothing come out, out of that the way? ordinary other than like normal dude shit? Yeah, normal dudes that you know would 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 have a scuffle here and there. I know some other guys that have been victimized as children, and it comes out in plain, unadulterated rage. So it's interesting how you know different people process well my different. rage came out that night at peg's house you know yeah it, it did pure pure rage that had been building for 30 years within me so you're a convicted murderer yeah you know i i went before Is that i weird got, to hear that they, I mean, kept, even though they, it's kept, been... they kept me in prison for an extra three months like i mentioned because when i was about to get released the parole bo- the head of parole called me to his office and said, uh, you know, the prosecutor never changed your paperwork. You're still down as first degree murder. And I'm like, you can't get released with that on your paperwork. It has to, it has to say second degree manslaughter. So it took, it took another three months for the paperwork to all get. Oh my God switched around so so that my right paperwork could say could allow me to be released i couldn't get released with so your lawyer so had to, to go so back when to- i stay i went to print you know when the when the when that classification board said you're the first inmate we've ever seen come before us who got five years for murder it's we have never ever seen that explain to us how that happened. my paperwork said you know first degree murder five years Wow. Or it should have said 30 to life. Or you, it should have, or it should have said second degree manslaughter. Do you see yourself as a murderer or something different? Um you know, I use the term from time to time and and people will say uh, How so? You you say I'm a murderer? In my speech I say I murdered. You know, I don't call myself a murderer, but I say I murdered and people will be like you know, some people you do that for effect. I, the fact of the matter is I murdered the guy, right? Know? It's a fact, you know, so if you, you know, if we want to use semantics, I, I did murder him, you know, so it, uh, it is what it is, you know, you know, it's interesting, like we, we humans, we especially in the in nice places like America, like we want to go through life where shits nice and neat and clean and tidy and i talk about this from time to time like even the food that we eat and we go we want to go to a butcher what do you do now by the way work as a butcher (laughs) you want to go to the butcher and you don't go out like i'm a hunter most people want a perfectly packaged piece of meat without fur on it you know ready for them to put it in the pot or the pan or on the grill and they want to take all of the gruesomeness away and I don't think what you did was right. I'm not judging you because I didn't walk in your shoes and I don't need to think what you did was right. But I know that probably 99.9% of anybody that heard your whole story would say, why did it take so long for somebody to do something to stop this person? And we want like this clean world and we've got these, these beautiful laws that our constitution codifies but sometimes they don't f- protect kids from f- monsters. It's terrible. And that's what, you know, one of the main things when I saw you give that uh, talk, somebody had sent that to me. I thought, I, mean, I got to call this guy and, and chat with him some more. It's, I think on one side, you've got all these amazing things that, that doctors and researchers and psychologists and, 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 and mental health professionals and drug and, and, uh, alcohol counselors uh, understand and work on and work through, but sometimes somebody's got to f- do something to stop a monster. That's yeah. the you can talk about but shit all you was, f- want. Whether the cops went to his house and were like, "Look, dude, we know what you're doing. We're going to be watching you." Right. Like, put the he got out from three cases. He he felt untouchable. You know, maybe there was other cases that the prosecutor simply didn't find, but he found three cases and, and Peg slithered out from underneath those three criminal cases. The state police 
also told me that one of their detectives put together a whole dossier on Peg involving another case with a boy, went up to the prosecutor's office. This was back in early 80s. Gave it to the prosecutor's office and it disappeared and never saw the light of day. The state police put it together, took it to the prosecutor's office, and it just fell into the cracks. Mm -hmm. So that's another, so that's, that, that's number four there. Um, any idea how many people this guy brutalized? Is there any, anybody have any kind of a uh, guess? I have, I have someone who works, uh, I don't want to like give it away, but somebody who sat in on a lot of meetings after my arrest on peg. And they said to me, since I've been released, uh, like I sat in on all the meetings on PEG and the number of victims has to be well over a hundred. God. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the lives. And then the lives that people like you that made children, all the lives affected down that, down that stream that one person can just so cause such dire impact to his disgusting. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, there's, there, you know, I tiptoe around some stuff, you know, I have a family member who knew Peg quite well. Let's mm. just say I had a next door neighbor who was in the boy Scouts with Peg and committed suicide at 23. I've had a bunch of people from Stillwater reach out to me after I got released privately on social media and be like, Clark, I have to apologize to you that I didn't come forward when you got arrested, but the same thing happened to me by Peg. And, uh, and they just wanted to, they're like, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to come forward to the cops. Um, I've had three different sets of sisters from my area who have said our brother was abused by Peg and is off the rails. Like, um, you know, it just goes on and on and on, you know, uh, it's just countless lives destroyed. And, uh, and I speak out just to try to limit the amount of carnage that people go through in their life. You know, if they can hear me talk, if they can hear me say how I began healing, how much I overcame, I'm facing life in prison for murder. I'm in the same jail being held for murder where the guy worked his whole career. And yet I climbed myself out of, out of that basement. When I got out of prison, Mick, I became I became an advocate for overturning the statute of limitations law in New Jersey. Um, I decided I wanted to file a lawsuit against the Boy Scouts because they did with Peg what they do with the priests. They moved him from location, location, location. When you read his obituary, it even says Scoutmaster at Troop blah blah blah. Scoutmaster at Troop blah blah blah. Scoutmaster. They, he got moved around just like a priest gets moved around. So, so you're Only suggesting that, for that one reason. you're suggesting that allegations were made and the Boy Scouts of America, it, rather than removing him, they moved him to a different location to take him away from the uh, accuser. Or he moved himself. Yeah. Um, Did you sue the Boy Scouts? So I went in. I wanted to sue the Boy Scouts. I went to a high profile law firm. And the guy, the lawyer read me the New Jersey law and he said, you have no case the way the law states. And he said, it may be healthy for you coming out of prison to become an advocate and work to overchange the law. There's advocates who have been working for 15 years to get a new law and they haven't gotten anywhere. Maybe you can use your story as fire hmm. to you know, uh, get the senators and, and assembly people in line to vote for this. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'll do it. 
So I went in there for selfish reasons, just for myself. And when I walked out of the office that day, I represented every abuse victim in New Jersey. And I met with senators and assembly people and lawyers for the Catholic Church. And less than two years after becoming a uh, advocate, I was in Trenton, New Jersey to see the new law voted into, in, it, the new bill voted into law. We went from having the worst law in the country to having the strongest law in the country. I love it. Yeah, and that's something myself and every every other advocate that worked on it was an abuse victim. So it's my myself and all the other uh, abuse victims slash advocates can go to our grave feeling uh, proud about what we did. I love that. Having been involved in in that political process for many years myself, I think it's awesome when people take responsibility for that. What you brought up going to your grave. What what do you want to be remembered for? Well, you know, I got you know, I and hopefully I you don't die of, for a good long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope not. You know, I got out of prison, and uh, I'm like, I can't just sit on my couch with my feet up with a remote control in my hand and proclaim to the world that I'm healed. I need to help other people avoid the mistakes I made. And I need to other, help other people heal and not feel alone with their pain. And in the process that helps me heal. So that's why I became a speaker, you know, speaking, you know, speaking at abuse centers, uh, speaking at uh, substance abuse centers, speaking at jails, prisons, speaking at churches. Uh, I, I spoke at uh, plays that were based on molestation. I spoke after the, the director of the play asked me twice to come speak on stage after the, the play was over. Um, you know, high schools, colleges, uh, just to bring awareness and just to uh, help people not feel alone. When when I've spoken at high schools, before I get to my vehicle, I'm getting Instagram messages from, from kids in the audience who have been abused reaching out to me. You know, they need... How does that make you feel? Yeah, it's incredible, dude. You know, uh, literally every day I have messages to answer. I've had messages from from predators who like want me to help them heal like uh, uh, how, how do you how do you reconcile that i've been posting and talking about abuse of children for a while and i get the predator side messaging me from time to time nobody has yet said help me but what i get by the verbiage is don't tell people how to how to raise their kids or how to um uh, uh punish them or you know don't you know let, and you you see that they're defending this is mostly physical abuse in regards to punishment beatings really not not sexual abuse i've never had anybody try to protect themselves from that but um i don't want to help you you know, I mean, I do in the sense of like the broader term, but that's my that's my response. Like, where are you? Let's meet in a parking lot. <laughs> like, of course, I'm joking, but, uh, you know, that's my immediate like visceral reaction to that. Oh, you want to you tell me that whipping kids with belts and sticks is is the right thing to do? Come on, try that. Let's do that. Yeah, you know, I, I just. I, 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 you know, I, I just tell them like, and, and they, you know, the, the, the pedophiles that have reached out to me have all claimed they were abused and that's why they did it. You know, my therapist says that's not necessarily what statistics show, you know, everybody thinks that pedophiles were abused as children. And she says, she says, no, that's not true. Mm. Uh, she said they, they use that. As you hear that a lot. You hear that as a justification. Yeah. yeah, they use that as a ju justification for their for what they've done. Um, but I, I just tell them if you know, I, I say if it's true that that you were abused and you went and did it, I'm like, you should have 
the conscience to 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 go heal yourself to get into therapy to do everything you can to not go down that road yeah who of anybody if you were an abuse victim should know that and not repeat what was done to you you already know how horrible it is and you're repeating that horror to others why you you have to take it upon yourself to heal yourself so this never happens again yeah well, that, that's really all i could tell them you know what's the number one thing you can tell a young person i think like there's two this is just my non-medical professional viewpoint i think there's like two sides of this equation from the victim maybe three the kid that's maybe the one getting groomed the kid that's getting abused or then the adult like us that's been abused that is through the abuse but is trying to heal through it like one of my of course all of those people need help but one of my goals is let's not get to the point where there's a adult sucking pills and booze to get through life like what's the, and you mentioned few things what are some things from your own experience and from uh all of the the therapy and counseling you've done that young people in the position of either being abused or being uh maybe just good information to know hey you've said some things like the tussling of the hair and that kind of shit. what are just a couple things that come to mind that we can help uh give people some tools yeah, well, number you know, number one, back in the seventies, eighties, there was no organizations for abused children. You know, there was nobody for me to go to. Um, you went to the police, and that was it. You know, like the, those those Boy Scouts with the hickeys all over their body. Their parents took them to the state police. They filed charges, and then just sent them home. There was no. There was no, you know, children advocacy centers back then. Now mm -hmm. there is, you know, so, and back then there was nobody speaking out about it. So back then I felt alone and I'm sure every other child felt alone because there was no social media. There was no way to get in contact with any other abuse victims. There was no way to know back then that you weren't alone, that there was millions of other people who had this done to them. And that isolation, that mindset of nobody will understand what I'm dealing with, you know, destroys you. So you're not alone, number one. There's, there's a lot of advocacy centers in every county now that handle abuse victims. Police are better trained, prosecutors are better trained to handle abuse victims. When you go to the prosecutor in our county now, we have a place called Ginny's House. I did a, I did a fundraiser and I raised money for Ginny's House. The prosecutor, when you go to the prosecutor, then they take you right to Ginny's House to begin healing and therapy. Um, and and to any to parents, you can't take an authoritarian approach when you when you notice changes in your child's behavior whether that's drugs and alcohol self-harm cutting whatever it is weight gain there's a reason behind it look past the getting pissed off and upset part of with your child and and think say to yourself all right there's something going on with my child i have to open up a dialogue with them in order to get them to open up to me what's going on so so try to avoid the authoritarian military approach hmm. to dealing with your child's behavior. Realize that there's something going on that's creating this behavior. And then uh, for, for, for children, you know, if a young adult should see this, uh, don't let your mind tell you that talking about this is reliving it and we're not going to do that. You have to talk about it. You have to begin healing immediately. If you do not open up, you're going to have a lifelong of self-destruction. You're going to have problems throughout your life. You think you'll be fine. You think you can just bury it. As I mentioned, I didn't even equate how I was living to my abuse. I just thought, oh, whatever, I'm a little wild and crazy. Hmm. 
uh, you know, and that's what's going on with me. So if they if they look at my story, there's so many different avenues for for parents, for, for abuse victims, for people who weren't even abused, who are just down and out in life. I had I picked myself up from from the hell I was in, you know, to raise myself up. So life is never over. You can overcome anything. So, you know, so, so don't, you know, our minds think they're protecting us by keeping us quiet, but that's the worst thing an uh, abuse victim can do. And that keeping quiet is, is the predator's best friend. Yeah. They're stopped dead in their tracks if the abuse victim speaks out. So as, as scary as it is, you, you have to speak out just so, I, you know, you know, yeah, I, Dennis Pegg had 40 years to ruin lives and he would have kept ruining lives for until the day he died. Predators don't stop. Once they're a predator, that's it, man. You don't think that they change? No, I, I you know, can they? I guess I've never thought about this until yeah, you just I, said you know, that. I, I did. I did a uh, a girl approached me for her college thesis, and her uncle is a prominent psychotherapist who specifically treats pedophiles in prison, okay. and he thinks you can change that behavior. When I was in prison, the therapist I had, she was extremely liberal. She she would she said to our group class, she's like. To be a, a social worker in prison, you have to, it's a liberal position. She's like, I'm, I'm extremely liberal. I said to her in, she said to me one day, she's like, Clark, I just want you to be aware that the unit you're housed in, one out of three guys in your unit, closer to two out of three is there for a sex crime. She said, don't let these guys know what you did You'll have guys that'll try to amp you up to go after somebody. She's like, just don't, don't let them amp you up. And I said, one out of three, closer to two out of three guys on my units there for a sex crime. I go, let me ask you this. What do you do to help them to change their behavior before they get released? And she said to me, nothing. She said, they're master manipulators. They're liars and they don't want help. She goes, it's a waste of our time because they're not sincere about trying to heal. Our friend William April called them broken toys. Yeah, man. You know, it, it, you know, the ones, a couple that reached out to me sounded sincere about wanting to heal themselves. You know, uh, are there, you know, is it a case by case basis? I'm sure it is. You know, I did a speech for uh, the state of Pennsylvania Department of Probation for Juvenile Sex Offenders. Okay. I just was their keynote speaker for their annual conference. And uh, the lady who you heads told up them that your story, the story, yeah, the a lady bunch who of, heads a up bunch that of teenagers, yeah, and the lady who heads up the department who who you know got me to speak for them. She said, Clark, I think what we do is of the utmost importance. She said, all of the juvenile offenders were abused themselves. And they're just repeating what they had done to them, what they learned. And she said, we have to break that from them before they become adult. If they're 30, 40, 50, 60 and still doing this, it, it's over for them. It'll never change. She goes, but we have them in intense super fit supervision and intense therapy until the age of 21. And she said, and we have to, you know, get this behavior corrected by the age of 21. What'd you see in some of those guys' faces as you were talking? At that, that speech? Yeah. Yeah, they all came up, you know, like it's everybody involved in the juvenile process. So there was prosecutors, there was cops, there was therapists, you know, there was psychologists. This wasn't, this wasn't abusers. This was the people in the 
treatment in, side in the in the process of helping the abusers okay i thought that yeah. you were talking about you gave this speech to a bunch of teenage abusers uh, two of the people there said they work at the centers that do the therapy for the abusers and said would you come speak to the abusers and i'm like absolutely you know i agree with them i i think the juvenile aspect of it can be corrected you know the 50 year old guy I, I I just don't see it to be honest. I think that behavior is too ingrained. Yeah, I just I I don't see it. You know, I don't know. I you guess know, just thinking about our non non psycho kind of behaviors, how we go about life, how we interact, just things that we do. You, I, I run into people I grew up with, and they still have the same behaviors they did when we were in grade school. I'm not talking about abusing people, but just the way they joke or whatever yeah you get, yeah, you yeah, get yeah. to be an adult and you kind of you are who you are yeah, yeah yeah exactly that's it so did you talk to these youngsters no I'm a, no I'm, they said you know uh, i gave them my 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 card and my info and they're like all right we'll be in touch you know so i'm still waiting to set up speeches with them yeah. i dig it how do, how do people find you if they want to get you involved in a speech yeah i'm or... on all the social medias just under my name clark fredericks spell uh, your you... last name f-r-e-d-e-r-i-c-k-s i have a website site clarkfredericks.com on the website it says message clark the message comes right to my email um that's that's how a lot of people uh get me signed up for uh speeches that way you know i'm also uh represented uh by a talent agency engaged talent agency um but i have a uh i i have a uh a contract where I can do my set up my own speeches too, you know, besides what they set up for me. So it's an incredible uh, story, man. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, and, and you know, I didn't even mention, you know, I, I think an integral part of the story just to give people hope that nothing is out of the realm of possibilities is that that girl from college from 30 years ago, who I couldn't commit to, uh, I'm in her house right now, uh, doing this, podcast with you you know we I finally I waited two years after I got released from prison because I wanted to make sure I was in a good mental spot I had just gotten the law passed you know in New Jersey I was doing speeches and I'm like I want to reach out to Lisa and apologize for failing her so many years ago and I just wanted mm -hmm. to know why I failed her and I reached out to her and she was at a stage in her life where she was receptive to hearing from me. We got together two weeks later for a cup of coffee and uh, all our old feelings for each other came back and uh, you know, we fell back in love. That's you know? awesome. Yeah, so so you never know, you know, I, you know, I was suicidal when I was locked up and yet here, here i was addicted i was suicidal um facing life in prison and yet i have meaning to my life i get a law passed in in new jersey i i i counsel people on changing the direction of their life every day i reunite with the love of my life you know so people want instant change they want things to happen instantly it takes time you know your life didn't become destroyed overnight it's not going to get out of the gutter overnight, you know, but you start taking steps in a positive direction and doors just seem to open for you. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, I, I'm 10 and a half years sober. That's awesome. I, I could never envision my life without drugs or alcohol. Like I never saw a reason not to be drinking. Now I, I don't, you know, I, uh, you know, you have that thing about changing people, places and things. I can't, I can't go back hanging out. I can go out to a dinner with my buddies who I used to party with, you know, once in a blue moon. I can't, I can't be hanging with them on a regular basis, going right. to bars. I have zero interest to hang in a bar. Sure. You know, it doesn't interest me. I go to the gym every day. Uh, I work six days a week at, at, as the butcher. I'm doing speeches. Uh, I'm I'm doing podcasts. I'm working on a book. I have a book deal with Simon and Schuster. They want Fantastic. the book. Yeah, October of uh, next year, they want the book completed. 
I just finished up a documentary. You know, so there's a lot going on. I, I can't, I can't, you know, when your life goes in a new direction, Mick, you you get a new group of people that are helping you in that direction. You know, my party friends who are still, you know, they're still my boys, they're over here in this this section. If I want to go over to that section and have a dinner once once every six months, once a year, they're there. If they called me up, they needed anything, I'd be there. If I called them up for anything, they would do the world for me. But they're not helping me in this trajectory of my new life. And I've got a whole new group of people that are helping me in that trajectory. It's the state trooper that walked into that cell and apologized to me. He and I are best friends now. He's retired. We've done half a dozen speeches together. Uh, my first speech was at a uh, uh, at a college, and the college professor who taught criminal justice there he was using my courtroom video as a teaching tool to his class, not even knowing that I was coming there to speak. Which he is and pretty I hard to watch, by the way. Yeah, watch that. Tough. Yeah. You know, I was a broken dude still, you know, and people ask like that soft white underbelly. I was able to go through it. You you take that that 15 minute video from my court appearance and I could hardly get words out. And then you go to the soft white underbelly and the words are flowing. And Which I tell 10 people, years later. Yeah, I tell people like the more you tell your story, the easier it'll get, the less the, the claws that your pain having you will have every time you tell it, it just starts loosening and it's not so emotional anymore, you know? Yeah, so so anything is possible, bro, but you just gotta decide that you're done with self-destruction and you want your life to go in a new direction and then doors will just seem to open, you know? Somebody like Mickey will reach out to you and be like, hey, be on my podcast. I'm like, absolutely. I dig it. Yeah. I think too often we don't feel that we have the power to affect change in the world. Like too, too often, I know I've been guilty of it at different times in my life. Like, who am I? Why should anybody listen? Or what do I have that to share talking about politics or telling your story? Uh, Michael Baines, a, a, a writer, a TV personality in kind of the space I'm in. And I interviewed him once and, and I had asked him about, his life and like how he approached interviews. And he always says, when he talks to somebody, he says, tell me a story. And his thought always was, everybody's got a story. Everybody's got some story. And it's kind of the soft white underbelly, like the premise of like that, that show, but the amazing uh, stories and, and flows of life that's all around us that we don't even think about. We're like, we're looking at idiots in Hollywood like, right. oh, what, what do they do? What do they got to share? And it's like, F these people, like look at next door at a guy like Clark, that's the butcher down the street or, <laughs> and, which is a very bizarre job for you. But. <laughs> Dude, listen to this. <laughs> and I got to say, it's kind of, sort of tongue in cheek as, you know, a comedy, but so I, I wear the white coat, the white butcher coat. Of course it gets blood stains all over it. And I, you know, I have a knife in my hand all day. The, the market I work at is a specialty market, which is right outside the courthouse, right outside the prosecutor's office, right outside the jail. Those three things are right there, and the market is within 100 feet of them. And every day, and then, and then the town police are right down the road. Is this so, in the county that you grew up in? Yeah. So all day, the prosecutors come in. The lawyers come in, the jail guards come in, the New Newton police come in, and there I am in my bloody white apron with my knife in their hand, and they just like, Fredericks, that just isn't right. <laughs> they, they start laughing, and, uh, you know, we've had a little chuckle, you know, but you gotta, you know, you, you have to have a dark sort of humor sometimes over tragedy, you know, the cops use that all the time, you know, to deal with the, the crap they, they have to see on a day in and sure. day. Yeah, nurses, firefighters. Yeah, yeah they exactly. all got that kind of soldiers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, I really, really appreciate that you took the time to chat with us. 
Um, you've told the story before, but as you know, the more kind of places that you leave this story behind, the more people that will hear it and and get some value out of it. Uh, I, I hope uh, hope to meet you in person. I get through New Jersey all the time, so I'll definitely uh, that was that was the original plan. It just didn't work yeah. with our, our schedules. I want to get out there and and hook up with you. Uh, final words. Um, nothing is impossible, you know, and I, I love this saying that I, you know, I crafted, um, you have to learn to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. If you want to heal, if you want to grow in life, you want to take your life in a new direction, you're going to have to do uncomfortable things to do that. And you have to become comfortable doing them. So don't shy away from the painful things. Don't shy away from the things that are uncomfortable. Just learn to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. I dig it. You guys that have listened, thank you for tuning into another episode of the Higher Line podcast. ClarkFredericks.com to follow more of his stuff. Be well. Don't be dickheads. Protect kids. Tell somebody you love them. Peace. Amen. Visit our website, kerrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Kerry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at kerrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at kerrytrainer.com or kerrytrainer.com. Said I got me some gunfire gun love. Gunfire gun love, baby. Gunfire gun old, no more gunfire blue. Made in the USA. Amazing new Brissette. A hundred percent synthetic, baby. So it's gonna last you longer. So go on carrytrainer.com and order yourself some gunfighter gun or gunfighter lube to get rid of your gunfighter gunfighter blues. I said go on and order yourself some gunfighter.